Good afternoon, Excellencies, distinguished guests, participants, ladies and gentlemen. The Korea-US Public Diplomacy Forum 2021 begins now. This forum was co-hosted by the Center on Media Diplomacy at Hankook University of Foreign Studies and Center on Public Diplomacy of the University of Southern California and sponsored by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Republic of Korea. My name is Hyunjin Kim, a researcher at the Center on Public Media Diplomacy at Hankook University of Foreign Studies. It is my great pleasure and honor to be an MC for this forum. The Korea-US Public Diplomacy Forum 2021 was prepared for the closer development of the existing US-Korea diplomatic relations, as well as discussion of diplomatic visions and policies at the level of public diplomacy. We hope that this first Korea-US Public Diplomacy Forum will provide a good opportunity to enhance our understanding of global and regional issues and to design the future of bilateral cooperation. To prevent the spread of COVID-19, this forum will be broadcast live online on YouTube in strict compliance with government quarantine guidelines. We would like to express our deepest gratitude to the viewers on YouTube for watching and paying attention to this forum, the major domestic and foreign distinguished guests who attended, and the presenters and panelists of the forum. From now on, I would like to declare the opening ceremony of the Korea-US Public Diplomacy Forum 2021. First of all, there will be an opening address, Young Gil Che, Director of the Center on Media Diplomacy at Hankook University of Foreign Studies. We hope to welcome him with a big round of applause. Good afternoon. I'm sorry. Um, my name is Yeonggil Che, uh, director of the uh, Center on Media Diplomacy at Hankook University of Foreign Studies. Uh, it is a great honor uh, to host this wonderful um, Korea-US uh, Public Diplomacy Forum 2021. Uh, this event is prepared with the support from Ministry of Foreign Affairs in South Korea. I would like to thank you for organizing and attending uh, this forum. Jung Ho Kyun, Director of Public Diplomacy of MOPA. Dr. Jay Wang, uh, Director of USCC Center on Public Diplomacy. And uh, also I want to uh, uh, say my thank you to my fellow scholars from uh, Korean Association for Public Diplomacy. The Korea-US Public Diplomacy Forum is designed to develop and implement uh, various uh, new public diplomatic policies to promote dialogue and understandings between the two countries. This forum is inaugural seminar to develop into more diverse public diplomacy programs in the coming years. Next year, as you know, it will be 140 years since the two countries have established diplomatic relations. In 1882, the treaty was established by Joseon Dynasty and the US, known as a Treaty of Peace, Amity, Commerce, and Navigation. The first section of the treaty dictates that Joseon would pursue Hwapyeong Uho with the US. Hwapyeong Uho means a harmonious and peaceful relationship of friends. It's a good meaning. However, Hwapyeong Uho in the 21st century might have a very different context from that of Joseon dynasty in the late uh, 19th century. The international status of Joseon dynasty 140 years ago and the Republic of Korea today is incomparable. In the past, if a peace and friendship was forced to maintain Joseon dynasty's safety, today as a middle uh, power country, Korea is asking for active cooperation to promote peace and friendship beyond the two countries, including 
more broad regions such as uh, Eastern Asia. In particular, amid rising risks, not only in international relations, but also climate and environmental security, we should now pledge peace and friendship between the publics from both countries. Today, we wish this forum provides a way to lay the groundwork for effective and productive Korea-US public diplomacy policies for peace, stability, and prosperity in the region and beyond in this rapidly changing international relations and the social cultural environment. Thank you again for your attendance and support. We wish you have a wonderful time today. Thank you. He thanked everyone who joined today's forum and he emphasized that Korea and United States are connected through a long history. Then there will be a congratulatory remarks by Jong Ho Gyeon, Director General for Public Diplomacy and Cultural Affairs of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Please welcome him with a big round of applause. Thank you. Uh, Professor uh, Kisuk Cho, a former president of Korea Association of uh, Public Diplomacy, and Professor Jay Wang, uh, director of the USC Center on Public Diplomacy. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to extend my warmest welcome to the professors and researchers uh, who join us today at the Korea US Public Diplomacy Forum. Especially, uh, I would like to thank the participants from the US and Canada, uh, despite of the late night time. Uh, I think today's forum is very meaningful uh, in a sense that it provides a valuable platform for researchers of the two countries to take stock of the current Korea-US relations from the public diplomacy perspective. I hope this forum can continue in the future. Uh, Korea and United States have developed a close relations based on the about 70 years of uh, security alliance. As we saw from the uh, successful result of bilateral summit meeting last May, the two countries have, uh, are expanding uh, areas of cooperation into global health, uh, climate change, global supply chain, and even outer space. It is a, a mutual friendship and a deep trust between the peoples of the Korean and the uh, US that served as a linchpin in this cordial bilateral relations. Uh, even if offline uh, public diplomacy activities were limited because of COVID-19 this year, Korean government has held various online uh, webinars and conferences in new areas of cooperation. Uh, health experts from two countries have discussed ways to strengthen global response to pandemics last May, uh, in the International Seminar for Climate Change uh, response in cooperation with the GGGI and the World Resource Institute was held in May. In August, experts of the UN, US NASA attended the Space Diplomacy Forum organized by the Korean Science and Technology Institute, uh, which is a STEPI, and suggested uh, ideas to enhance bilateral cooperation in outer space. And recently, uh, American public growing interest in K-pop, Korean movie and drama is contributing to enhancing cultural exchanges and deepening bilateral relations. As you know, uh, BTS movie Parasite and the Squid Game of Netflix drama are also popular in US as well as in Korea. Now many uh, Americans want to know more about Korean food, language and culture as a whole. Last month, uh, President Moon Jae-in appointed BTS as a special presidential envoy for future generation culture uh, to enhance, to encourage the young generation support for the global effort to achieve sustainable development goals. As a key partners, which shares common value like democracy, market economy, and open society, Korea will closely uh, closely cooperate with the US to promote international cooperation in global issues. 
And ladies and gentlemen, at, at the uh, 76th session of the UN General Assembly last September, uh, President Moon Jae-in emphasized dialogue and cooperation and coexist and ensure the prosperity for the security of global community. He also suggests the end of the war declaration as a pivotal point of departure in creating a new order of reconciliation and cooperation on Korean Peninsula. We expect continued support from the peoples of Korea and the United States for our joint effort toward the permanent peace on the Korean Peninsula. Today, I look forward to suggestion for uh, practical measures on public diplomacy that can contribute to enhance mutual understanding between peoples of two countries and deepening bilateral relations. Thank you very much. He mentioned that he hoped this forum would have simultaneous cooperation between two countries in various fields of culture and public diplomacy. Now, this will be followed by the first session of the forum. Session one discusses the topic of the role of Korea-US public diplomacy to strengthen alliance. This session will be moderated by Ki Suk Cho, former president of the Korean Association for Public Diplomacy and professor of Ihua Women's University. I want you to all, I want you all to give her a big round of applause. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I am very pleased to moderate today's first session as the former host of the Korea-US Public Diplomacy Forum, uh, which was held in Wilson Center, Washington, DC, uh, several years ago. That was the beginning of this forum. And I'm uh, very happy to observe and participate the the continuous forum today. And we have a speaker for the first session is the Dr. Jay Wang, the director of the USC Center on Public Diplomacy and associate professor at the USC Edinburgh School for Communication and Journalism. He previously worked for the international consulting firm McKinsey and Company, where he advised clients on matters of communication strategy and implementation. So uh, Jay, are you with us? Yes, I am. The session will be organized uh, like um, 15 to 20 minutes, uh, Dr. Wang's presentation, and will be followed by uh, 10 minutes uh, discussion by two discussants. And I'm going to introduce discussants later uh, as we have Jay Wang on the screen. So Jay, good to see you again. Good to see you, Professor Cho. Good evening, in fact. <laughs> yes, uh, good afternoon to you. Okay, so are you ready to go? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, thank you so much for your introduction and hi everyone. Um, greetings from Los Angeles. Uh, it is a great pleasure uh, for me to participate in today's forum. Thanks to the Center on Media Diplomacy at Hankou University of Foreign Studies for organizing the program. And the USC Center on Public Diplomacy is very delighted to be part of the discussion. And I would like to add our welcome uh, to all of you uh, to the Korean US Public Diplomacy Forum 2021. As we all know, public diplomacy is increasing in importance and pro prominence in light of the changing geopolitical and the geoeconomic uh, situations, as well as the rapid developments in digital technology. Traditionally understood as a country's effort to inform and influence foreign publics, 
through public communication, cultural exchanges, cultural programming, and more, public diplomacy is expanding as a set of activities and practices that integrate diplomatic, corporate, and social interests. Together, these activities are vital to the promotion of global security and prosperity through the generation of soft power, the ability to achieve desired outcomes through attraction rather than corrosion. As noted in the National Intelligence Council's Global Trends 2040 report, I quote, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic marks the most significant singular global disruption since World War II with health, economic, political, and security implications that will ripple for years to come. And the report continues to point out, I quote, the response to the pandemic has fueled partisanship, polarization in many countries as groups argue over the best way to respond and seek scapegoats to blame for the spread of the virus and for slow responses. Of course, the pandemic does not alter the fundamental dynamics already underway. It undoubtedly has amplified the tensions and stresses in our global system and is accelerating the change in our global thinking and our thinking and practice concerning global affairs and in public diplomacy as well. But the essence of public diplomacy remains the same, which is building relationships with stakeholders across political, economic, and social dimensions to advance international policy and action. Its functionalities have certainly broadened. Its main consequence is to see, uh, is, is uh, to, uh, to, to what extent uh, the opinion environment helps to broaden or actually it hurts or limits uh, policy options. Since the practice of public diplomacy is essentially a set of communication-centric activities, I'd like to focus on just one aspect uh, of this endeavor, which is the changing audience for public diplomacy by discussing the interweaving of the demographic, cultural, and technological contests. And hopefully that you know, we can have uh, discussions on what are the implications uh, for our research analysis uh, in this realm so that we can better inform our public diplomacy strategy thinking and implementation. Understanding who is your audience, or some would prefer the term stakeholder, is central to organizing public diplomacy strategy and planning, whom to engage and why should they care, are typically the first two questions that we ask. Although we are looking at both the US and South Korea in today's forum, and my comments uh, will primarily be based on uh, the US experience. Um, and I hope that uh, in, the, in, the, in the panel discussion uh, that follows um, uh, my comments, uh, that we certainly will broaden uh, the, uh, the, the discussion of, uh, about, you know, uh, in South Korea, for instance, uh, the uh, uh, perceptions or the, the attitudes uh, concerning uh, the US, uh, both as a society, as a polity. So first, in terms of audience, the most fundamental shifts are demographic. Uh, for instance, uh, developed economies are experiencing population aging, while much of the developing and emerging economies are seeing a so-called youth bulge. And more than half of the world's population now lives in urban cities, and this trend will continue to reach 68% by 2050, according to a UN projection. With international migration, the population mix in many countries, especially in the West, is undergoing ethnic remapping. In the United States, by 2050, uh, by 2050 according to one projection, non-Hispanic whites is expected to make up less than half of the population. Hispanics is going to grow to 29% of population from 14% in 2005, and Asians to 9% from 5% in 2005. The 2020 US census data, which just came out, shows that the non-Hispanic white population declined for the first time in the nation's history. According to the Wall Street Journal's diversity index for each of the 3,000 counties in the country, nationwide, the diversity index increased by 22% over the past decade, and diversity rose the fastest 
in the Midwest, the so-called the heartland of America. The census data does not illuminate on the more complex and nuanced demographic development in terms of people of mixed parentage and their ethnic or racial identification, especially after second or third generation. At the same time, the geographic movement of people has produced bicultural, multicultural people and in between diaspora publics who hold values and beliefs that are intermediate among cultures. And many now live transnational lives. In the US, the foreign born population reached almost 45 million in 2018, constituting close to 14% of the US population near, nearing the historic high of the 14.8% in the early part of the 20th century. Compared with the earlier waves of immigrants, the vast majority of foreign born residents these days are from Latin America and South and East Asia. Shares of foreign born population are even higher in a number of OECD countries. For instance, Australia is close to 30%, Canada 20%, and the United Kingdom uh, 13%. As a result, more and more people in the US are encountering an increasingly culturally diverse daily existence from shopping malls and neighborhoods to schools and workplaces. Now human experience is intrinsically historical and social. On the one hand, one feels the yearning for connecting the present to the past in order to affirm a sense of self against obvious changes in the everyday. We seek historical continuity and authenticity so as to validate who we are and what we are becoming. So the result is a constant nostalgia for the way we were. Meanwhile, our being is also a social conjoint experience. In public spaces and social settings, we now have more opportunities than ever to experience the more heterogeneous world, both as a foreigner and an outsider and as an insider and someone who is being visited upon by others. Cultural mob mobility in this sense is genus-based. As the cultural critic uh, Stefan Greenblatt pointed out, it, I quote, can indeed lead to heightened tolerance, tolerance of difference and an intensified awareness of the mingled inheritances that constitute even the most tradition-bound cultural stance. But it also can lead to an anxious, defensive, and on occasion violent policing of the boundaries. The political scientist Samuel Huntington argued, I quote, in fundamental ways, the world is becoming more modern and less Western. Cultural context can be harmonious mixing and mingling, but can also be contentious. So contact theory, as we all know, suggests that social contact can reduce prejudices between groups, given our tendency for homophily in social interactions, especially against the real or feared downward economic and social economic mobility, our cultural interactions often provoke our basic impulses of prejudice, which is a negative context, contact situation. The French uh, political scientist Laurent Bouvet calls the phenomena cultural insecurity. Many people lack the capacity and resources to cope with the cultural angst brought by the fast pace of globalization. Now, ours is also an age of information abundance flooded with images and sound bites which creates the so-called attention economy. The poverty of attention necessitates the competition for our attention and social media are mechanism for such competition, which is amplifying social division and polarization for the platform's business gains. As Jamie Settle has shown in her work on Facebook, social media exposure activates negative feelings toward those who hold different political views and therefore resulting in Americans becoming more negative about each other. But social media doesn't act alone. There are also the polarizing talk radio, cable news, et cetera. The feature of social media allow for that kind of a transparency for inadvertent exposure that tradi traditional media do not. More important, the social conditions of the changing economic structure and expanding globalization have created broad-based discontent among segments of the American public. There is a lack of consensus as regards international engagement among elites and public alike. So as you know, negative emotion is more attention getting and subtlety and compromise are not favored in the media ecosystem. 
the information cacophony in the digital space with disinformation and misinformation, the confusion of what's interesting with what's important exacerbates our distrust and incredulity. To make, make matters worse, in elite competition, the rhetoric access of political leaders through these channels of communication makes the public sphere even more vivid and visceral, feeling the fire that's already burning. So popular emotion and public opinion are exerting greater constraints on policies and state actions in general. These trends point to the basic reality of a changing audience for public diplomacy in terms of their backgrounds, expectations, and the preferences for communication. So this is a very broad um, discussion about uh, what's happening uh, in the uh, landscape uh, from the perspective of uh, the audience uh, for public diplomacy uh, endeavors. So what does all this mean in the US-Korean relations in light of peace and all these uh, uh, challenging and complex issues, including peace and denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula, the increasing US-China rivalry, the conditions of global economy and global co governance, the success of South Korea's businesses, arts and popular cult culture on the world stage in recent times puts in focus Korea's international influence and its scope and the potential. In general, Americans have a very favorable view of South Korea, especially in the context of Americans' view uh, in contrast to Americans' view of North Korea. According to the Gallup polls, the favorability has increased over the past two decades from about 40 to 50% ratings in the 1990s to 60 to 70% positive ratings in the last 10 years. And meanwhile, US favorability, favorability among South Koreans have trended very positive with about 70% positive ratings, even during most of the Trump years. While America's image suffered significant decline during that time in many other countries. And according to the Pew Global Attitudes Report, South Koreans share the same concerns about climate change, spread of infectious diseases, cybersecurity, and many other uh, global societal threats. It is, however, harder to find further data and sound analysis of, for instance, American public's views about South Korea. Um, perhaps they don't have much understanding at all. It reminds me of what what Walter Lippmann wrote almost a hundred years ago about the world outside and the pictures in our head in his classic uh, public opinion. And I just uh, read here, this is uh, from a paragraph from his book. The only feeling that anybody can have about an event he does not experience is the feeling aroused by his mental image of that event. For the real environment is altogether too big, too complex and too fleeting for direct acquaintance. We are not equipped to deal with so much subtlety, so much variety, so many permutations and combinations. And although we have to act in that environment, we have to reconstruct it on a simpler model before we can manage with it. And this was written in 1922, as if it is written today in 2021, 100, almost 100 years later. Uh, equally important is the point Walter Littman made in, a, in, a, in the book, in that book. The simpler model is quote, not merely a shortcut, or, or he also called it economy of effort. It is all these things and something more. Stereotypes are therefore highly charged with the feelings that are attached to them. They are the fortress of our tradition. Behind its defenses, we can continue to feel ourselves safe in the position we occupy. So how we imagine other countries is invariably a function of our self-perception. In public diplomacy studies, we need to achieve a more sophisticated understanding of audience, their hopes and fears, and it requires a multidisciplinary effort. It is my hope that with discussions like this forum, that we'll start to invest research effort in understanding the audience context and, uh, and, and, and uh, um, through uh, discussions like this, that we will be able to uh, not only conduct, but also provide a kind of a sound analysis uh, regarding public diplomacy and also certainly uh, regarding the US Korean public diplomacy efforts. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Jay. Um, the Dr. Wang emphasized the uh, changing uh, audience over geopolitical and economic situations. And particularly he, he emphasized the diverse uh, composition of the um, population in the US in the future. So diverse ethnicity and the cultural diversity uh, will certainly require us to develop a model to understand these publics and these, the nature of the changing audiences. I think that is a very important point. And as we are witnessing the uh, growing importance and expansion of the uh, public diplomacy over the traditional diplomacy, uh, certainly he left us the, the task for the future, how we're gonna understand deeply the audiences and foreign publics, okay? And following uh, Jay's presentation, let me introduce uh, two discussions. Uh, the first discussion is Dr. Hung Gyu Kim. He's the founder of the US China Policy Institute and serves as director and professor in the Department of Political Science at Azure University. And he's currently serving for many boards and the uh, public uh, roles under the current administration and both in the Department of Unification and the, um, uh, in the area of national um, the, the defense reform. So I'd like to um, invite uh, the Dr. Kim uh, for about 10 minutes uh, discussion. And before that, let me briefly introduce also uh, Dr. Kadir Jun Aihan, who is an assistant professor of international relations at Iwa Women's Uni University, graduate school of international studies. And actually we are in the same department and I'm the director of the public diplomacy center where uh, Professor Kadir is the Deputy Director of the Center. Sorry for <laughs> you, our family. And the Professor Kadir will, uh, Kadir's discussion will be followed after the, the uh, Dr. Kim's presentation. Please welcome Dr. Kim. Uh, it's great honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, and also, I congratulate on uh, the uh, uh, you know uh, this great opening of uh, public diplomacy forum. Uh, before I came uh, here, I have I had no idea how uh, Jay Wong uh, make a presentation, and then uh, he uh, said uh, uh, the audience uh, uh, became uh, diversified. And also the, he uh, told us the implication of uh, uh, public uh, uh, diplomacy uh, to the US-South uh, US, uh, Korea uh, uh, alliance. Um, frankly speaking, I'm not uh, an expert in uh, you know, public uh, diplomacy, uh, but specialized in the uh, Chinese foreign policy and the US-China strategy competition and also the uh, uh, security issues in Northeast Asia. So um, uh, I'd like to the, uh, introduce some uh, idea on the uh, US-China strategy competition first, and then also the, in the strategy competition, how uh, we, I mean, the South Korea and the US uh, can cooperate in the international you know, arena. For several thousand years, uh, uh, Korea has been a part of Asia, a uh, continental power. After World War II, uh, as a US alliance, South Korea has transformed its uh, national identity into an Asian uh, Pacific force aligned with the maritime uh, power. Uh, under the liberal you know, uh, uh, international uh, order, uh, South Korea has been uh, quite successful 
in uh, you know uh, developing their own economy and also the, uh, we achieve the uh, uh, democratization and also we enter the uh, uh, information age. However, in the US-China strategy competition era deepening, uh, South Korea faces a new necessity to expand its strategic and geographic uh, scope uh, to the global level to meet the new challenges. And also the, uh, the rock us uh, you know, alliance must be transformed into the uh, new rubber and also the meeting to the uh, you know, demand of the new audiences. Uh, in the international arena. The United States and China entered an increasingly competitive uh, phase in relations, although uh, both must uh, manage the uh, policy mix of confrontation and competition and cooperation. China already uh, you know, declared the US-China strategic competition as a protracted warfare in uh, 2019. The COVID-19 and then the high-ranking officers Alaska meeting in March and the Wendy Sherman's visit to China in July didn't prevent the relations from worsening if mismanaged. Competition uh, could quickly tilt toward the missile calculation and the arms conflict between the United States and China. So there are some issues we may need to think over in the year of the US-China strategy competition. First, differing views in the United States and China on international order became apparent. The United States regards the word order as a bipolar one, but China views it uh, increasingly as a tripolar order composed of the US lead and the China lead and the uh, EU centered system. From China's strategic perspective, uh, South Korea has become a linchpin in the competition. Uh, China would pay more attention to diplomacy uh, to European countries and the middle powers like South Korea in the future. Second point is, United States uh, domestic politics also became a more critical variables in explaining the US foreign policies. The upcoming outcomes of the midterm congressional uh, election in 2022 and the uh, presidential election in 2024 probably favors the, the, uh, the GOP could lead to the uh, changes in international, uh, you know, uh, US foreign policies and security policies to more inward looking ones. The uncertainties of the US foreign policies increase now. Third, effective US uh, leadership in the region uh, hinges on getting policy right with the two most important US allies in this area, South Korea and Japan. China would invest more in them diplomatically and economically and with uh, in security to draw cooperation from both countries. Fourth, the United States must take the roles and interests of South Korea more seriously. Korea has enjoyed a long history of acquiring its uh, political autonomy from China, although it accepted a tribute system on the surface. Korea has been extremely sensitive to every attempt of the, uh, China's growing influence over the Korean Peninsula throughout history. South Korea is likely a bulwark against China's growing influence on East Asia. Finally, South Korea has the most favorable view on the US leadership in the world, which reaches uh, the uh, 77%. Japan is the following, only 53%, according to the Pew Research poll in 2020. South Korea has the most negative views on China in the world, along with the Japan and Sweden. Such public view on the United States in Korea must be the precious asset of the US you know, ROC you know, alliances. In the year of uh, strategic competition, uh, our the most important objective must be uh, the, uh, to promote uh, coexistence 
and cohabitation and symbiosis instead of a crushes. There are four areas in which the South Korea and United States can cooperate in international uh, public diplomacy arena. This is my suggestions. Uh, first, in international uh, development area, the competing, in initi uh, the competing initiatives of the US and China may result in the dichotomous words of decoupling between the uh, Northern and Southern hemispheres. South Korea must uh, bridge the two hemispheres in international development area. South Korean technology and production capabilities help the United States execute its uh, foreign policy in this area. Second, in establishing uh, new norms and regimes, South Korea must help the United States establishing new international norms and regimes in newly emerging security areas, such as uh, public health, cyber security, ecological environments, and uh, climate changes. Third, facilitating a cooperation among middle powers. This is the area what uh, South Korea can have for the United States as a playing important role, uh, probably uh, to deter uh, China's aggressive foreign policies. Finally, South Korea is a serious uh, partner uh, to the United States uh, for the liberal values of uh, democracy and uh, freedom. So there is a uh, new areas emerging uh, in between the United States and uh, South Korea to help each other. And then also this is the new area South Korea can uh, contribute to the new uh, alliance. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, Hanguk University of Foreign Studies uh, Media Diplomacy Center for organizing this forum and inviting uh, a great uh, lineup uh, for the panels and presentations. And thank you for inviting me as well. I, uh, I also did not get a chance to uh, look at uh, Jay's presentation before. So I, I'll also have to give my discussion on the spot. Uh, Jay started with a demographic background against which uh, public diplomacy is uh, conducted. And uh, Professor Kim, in his remarks, in his discussion, gave us the security context uh, against which the, uh, the uh, Korea-US alliance uh, works. And I'll try to bring these two together uh, and talk about uh, how public diplomacy can uh, function within uh, or to, to strengthen uh, the alliance against this uh, demographic and security context. And the title of our session is the role of Korea-US public diplomacy uh, to strengthen alliance. And uh, there are two aspects uh, of this title. First, uh, Korea's uh, foreign policy goals within the alliance. And second, uh, US uh, foreign policy goals uh, within the alliance. And the real question actually uh, we are trying to answer within this session is, how can public diplomacy help uh, form the basis or support uh, these two different foreign policy goals to help strengthen the alliance? Uh, so with this, uh, I also want to suggest that there is no one fit uh, public diplomacy model. Public diplomacy is contextual and uh, it must be customized, as Jay also suggested, uh, according to foreign policy goals, as well as, as, as Jay suggested, uh, uh, for the target audience, or uh, what we recently started calling stakeholders, rather than a passive uh, target audience. And what maybe uh, some of the 
foreign policy goals uh, that these two countries try to achieve within the alliance and how can public diplomacy help achieve those. Uh, for South Korea, uh, US alliance is the most consistent and strongest element of uh, Korean foreign policy. But South Korea is also emerging as not only a middle power, but more so as a great power or an author authority in specific global governance issue areas. If we understand world more of a, a multiplex uh, world order rather than thinking in terms of uh, polarity. And uh, Korea is seeking status in these uh, across different global governance issue areas. It's becoming much more important, for example, in global health governance. It's trying to uh, make its impact on global environmental governance, uh, so on and so forth. So US is very important both uh, in bilateral relations for the security of South Korea on the Korean Peninsula, but also uh, the US is the country that can accord this status um, most significantly to South Korea. And uh, for South Korea, there are two target audiences in the US, the, the grassroots, the mass publics, and also the foreign policy elites. Uh, and also public diplomacy must be customized according to these target audiences. For the grassroots, for the mass, maybe just awareness that Korea exists, Korea is there, Korea is doing great, Korea is doing excellent in certain uh, uh, aspects, including uh, culture or popular culture or visibility, uh, maybe enough uh, because the US is uh, very much interested in all countries across the world. Uh, it's really difficult to influence uh, the government's decisions through public opinion, just for one country. Hence, it makes uh, the US foreign policy elites even more important in, in South Korea's case, rather than vice versa. Uh, for the foreign policy elites, understanding South Korea's side, South Korea's policies is very important. For example, Professor Kim also mentioned uh, North Korea. Um, South Korea's North Korea policies are not, for example, as much understood in Washington uh, as uh, the South Korean government uh, would have liked, uh, mainly because of uh, the me media attention being more concentrated on the spectacle rather than uh, the reality on the ground. So th these are some of the aspects that South Korea can focus on, uh, trying to have its policies, foreign policies, especially North Korea policies, understood in Washington uh, by the foreign policy elites. And also trying to uh, get its status accorded by these foreign policy elites for cooperation uh, with the US in global governance issue areas. South Korea is no longer uh, South Korea of 60s or 70s. This is a new era as Amitabh Acharya calls it, a multiplex uh, world order where uh, different authorities uh, make import, uh, are important. They make changes in different global governance issue areas. Sometimes non-state actors, sometimes small powers, maybe more important than great powers in specific issue areas. And South Korea uh, successfully showed that it can achieve more than uh, many other countries in uh, specific issue areas, including peacekeeping, development and cooperation, uh, so on and so forth. So trying to get uh, more foreign policy elites uh, advocate for South Korea's uh, for, South, for South Korea to get the status it, uh, is, that is commensurate with its capabilities would be uh, very important for South Korea's public diplomacy in the United States. And I think uh, it, it is not a short run goal. It's, it's a goal for the long run. And Korean studies can play a very important role because the current generation of Korean studies who play an important role in decisions regard, regarding South Korea uh, are not, uh, what's the best way to put it? Are not, uh, for example, proficient in Korean language. 
but the upcoming, the new generation of uh, Korea scholars in the country are uh, much more prominent. Uh, I think they will become much more prominent because of uh, their desire to be understanding the context uh, of South Korea, political and social context of South Korea. And from the US perspective, US uh, foreign policy goals, uh, maintaining the alliance is very important, especially given, again, as Professor Kim suggested, given the security context in the region, uh, we have the Quad, we have the Australia, UK, uh, US security alliance, and South Korea's position is sometimes seen as ambiguous, and sometimes South Korea's position is taken for granted, but it can no longer be taken for granted, which makes public diplomacy even more important. And uh, for the US perspective, grassroots is also very important because uh, uh, Again, as I said before, US is the most important, the anchor of South Korea's foreign policy. So uh, public opinion can make a change uh, in government's uh, foreign policy decisions. Uh, and for the public opinion, for the mass public's opinion, the most important thing is good policies. So public diplomacy itself cannot change much. Uh, as Edward Murrow once said, if you want me during the, uh, clashes, crashes, you better have me during the takeoff stage. So public diplomacy can help only if there is good policy, not only in the uh, bilateral relations between South Korea and the US, but US overall uh, foreign policies, especially in regards to its alliance relationships. So I, I think I raised more questions than uh, giving any answers, but this, this would be my discussion for the time being. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Kim Hung-gyu and Kadil Ayan. Um, the topic for the, uh, the first session was the changing context of public diplom, um, sorry, the, um, the role of Korea-US public diplomacy to strengthen alliance. So it has both implications for public diplomacy and foreign policy. And uh, Jay Wang's uh, presentation was on the changing context of public diplomacy and implications for building US-Korea relations. And Professor Kim Hung-gyu as the uh, expert on China-US relations, uh, he has suggested several actually strategies and tactics that, that for the Korean government to take advantage of from the competition between China and US. And Professor Kadir Ahian also suggested uh, some practical solutions for strengthening alliance, such as participating and, and uh, in the, the making the, um, the governance, the peace governance or uh, development. There are several uh, the, the international norms that are required for the um, advanced countries to play. So uh, he suggested these kind of um, the options. Okay, now uh, I will give the uh, podium to Jay to respond to these suggestions. And I think their, their discussions are mostly complementary to your speech. So would you like to make a comment on that? Thank you, Professor Cho. And thanks to the uh, to panelists. I, um, so my uh, comments, um, in my comments, what I was trying to do is what, trying to orient us uh, more towards uh, kind of the future, um, especially when we bring in demographic, um, uh, the changes. And um, I, uh, I think that, um, you know, the suggestions um, about South Korea uh, strengthening its role as a middle power country, uh, especially in the context of great power competition and rivalry, um, that may uh, provide um, not only um, the sort of the opportunity, but actually it's a necessity uh, 
for middle power countries to play uh, some role um, uh, to uh, stabilize uh, uh, the system whenever it's needed. And um, the suggestion about South Koreans um, a more active role uh, in global governance uh, arenas. I also think that is, uh, you know, uh, the thing that South Korea, South Korea is already doing. And I and certainly think that uh, with uh, sustainable development goals, uh, climate and um, public health, you know, all those issues confronting us, I think South Korea uh, can expand that role. And we always kind of, you know, brought back to this issue of uh, the public diplomacy efforts, a lot of times in building relationships and in building in a way like cultural power, you know, when we talk about BTS, right? Uh, they certainly um, has tremendous cultural power, you know, increasing cultural power among uh, young people or even a much broader uh, segment of the public. And, but cultural power is just cultural power. If you want to use the power, you know, the word, um, the influence, um, how does that connect and translate into um, the, the, the changes um, in our policy. And I think that is always uh, a very complex issue that uh, uh, in public diplomacy studies that we're trying to you know, grapple with. And, um, and I certainly think that you know, with South Korea's growing uh, cultural influence, and uh, it does uh, provide uh, more room uh, for the country uh, to play a bigger role uh, because it's uh, more recognized, right? And um, um, it's, it becomes more familiar uh, to uh, different countries and the societies around the world. Um, so I do believe that um, uh, an enhanced role um, in advancing global governance uh, is uh, one of the critical areas uh, that South Korea can play. Um, yes, those are the two things that I just wanted to underscore, I think that both speakers uh, spoke about. Thank you very much. I think it is time to uh, give the opportunity to the floor. If you have any questions or comments, uh, you can just raise your hand, then our staff will deliver you the microphone. And the audiences who are watching our program from the YouTube, uh, you can write a question or comments in your, um, the, 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 under the YouTube so that our staffs can deliver the questions to us. Okay. Any other? Thank you so much. Uh, I got a question from YouTube audience. Uh, uh, this question uh, is directed to Jay. Recently, South Korea is swaying between China and USA and tension between two countries increases. Can you give suggestion how South Korea deal with this uh, situation wisely? <laughs> you know what, actually I, I appreciate uh, the, um, uh, whoever submitted uh, this question using the word wisely. I think what we need this day and age is wisdom in dealing with these complexity issues because, because there, there is no existing playbook in a sense, right? And, uh, um, and, and, but we also cannot afford making some of these mistakes, like the mistake that we made uh, during the pandemic, where we were not able to uh, come together, despite you know, the, the scientific breakthroughs uh, that we have been able to accomplish. But the world, you know, uh, for the last year and a half, <laughs> You know, hasn't been able to come together in a way that will help uh, to address this uh, issue, uh, this challenge more effectively. 
So, uh, so wisdom is is the word. <laughs> now, where does wisdom come from? <laughs> uh, I think that's a very good question. I mean, um, I think the South Korea, as I was just saying earlier, as a middle power country, and especially um, you know the role in the region uh, would play a, a, a vital role um, to um, um, you know to stabilize. Uh, the, 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 the regional system, the regional order, as well as the, the, the global system and global order. And, uh, but even US-China relations, you know, I'm not as an ex expert uh, as one of our other speaker. Um, um, you can see that it's kind of also evolving, right? And, uh, and so, so in a way, it's a, such a dynamic uh, situation. And, um, um, I can only say that we need to call on wisdom <laughs> uh, to, uh, um, uh, to address uh, this challenge. But I also think perhaps the best way for us to do this is look into the future and uh, to look down the road and to, to think about um, you know, um, our next generation like uh, uh, what kind of a society, you know, what kind of a world that we would imagine uh, for them. And because we're not just talking about our geopolitical, you know, competition, uh, we have, you know, uh, technological breakthroughs uh, that that's gonna change the way how we live and how we communicate and, and all of that. So, so maybe uh, having a longer view will put things in perspective for us for today. And uh, I also think that we always look back into history to learn some lessons. And I think that is also a very healthy, to, healthy thing to do. However, as we all know, because you know, um, uh, the age we're living, um, we don't wanna say it's unprecedented, it's so unique. Um, nothing is really that unique at the same time. Uh, there is a, uh, you know, uh, very different combinations um, and what Walter Lippmann was saying, permutations of things uh, that uh, we just had not experienced in, in the past. So, uh, so maybe it's by looking to the past and also having a perspective for the future that will help us to, uh, you know, to develop some wisdom to handle the challenges that we face today. As I am listening to this question, it reminds me of our traditional proverb saying that the shrimp gets hurt when whales are fighting each other. So Korea realized one day that we used to be a uh, shrimp, but uh, we are not that small country anymore. We are one of the advanced countries, but still we are listening to the same question that what should we do? during the competition between two superpowers. And uh, thank you very much, Jay, um, for emphasizing wisdom. And we have an expert here, uh, Professor Kim. Uh, would you like to respond to this audience's question? Uh, what should we do between the um, competition, uh, US and China? You are the expert. Actually, it was not the question to me, but uh, <laughs> um, South Korea faced uh, tremendous difficulties uh, uh, in the year of uh, US-China strategy competition because uh, United States has been the pillar for the South Korean uh, security. And then also uh, China was the, the number one country in uh, trading uh, and then also the uh, uh, South Korea's the uh, you know trade dependence on China is uh, above uh, thirty percent of our whole trade. So uh, uh, any uh, you know uh, no country can replace the other. Um, some opposition forces uh, criticize current uh, Moon Jae-in government as a uh, pro-China. Uh, however, uh, I do not agree with that kind of uh, you know uh, idea. Uh, no matter uh, you know conservative forces or progressive forces uh, became, uh, take the power in uh, Korea, 
uh, the alliance uh, between uh, South Korea and the United States has been the pillar uh, for South Korean's foreign and economic policies. Uh, there uh, was, there is no exception, uh, even including the uh, Moon Jae-in government. Even Moon Jae-in government uh, pay uh, you know uh, special attention to the uh, improving relationship uh, with uh, North Korea, but uh, uh, they would never go beyond a kind of agreements between the South Korea and uh, the United States. In uh, you know, uh, uh, so. Uh, South Korea uh, continued to be a good, uh, you know, a key ally uh, with the United States. And, um, but uh, uh, throughout our history, what we learned is uh, we should not be an, uh, just uh, anniversary, uh, adversary against the uh, China. Uh, that should not be an enemy. You know, throughout our history, uh, we uh, got the kind of uh, uh, war or a military invasion over uh, about uh, 1,000 uh, times. Uh, out of 1,000 times and the 450 times coming from the North, which uh, means uh, from China. So, uh, we experienced the major wars uh, against China, and then also the we are most knowledgeable uh, nation and country about China in the world. So uh, we uh, pays a very uh, you know uh, key keep attention our attention to uh, every inch of a Chinese move. So uh, we want to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, friendly and uh, you know, cooperative partner with China. However, if China uh, takes excessive, you know, uh, pressure upon South Korea or over North Korea, we Koreans, uh, uh, you know, ready to fight back always. That's why this is the kind of secret of our survival. So there are only two countries in the world who experience that kind of, you know, uh, uh, attitude toward China, uh, Vietnam and uh, Korea. So you can imagine how, uh, you know, difficulties uh, uh, China face in dealing with North Korea, which is quite uh, similar to the that of uh, South Korea. So, uh, you know, we have, we share the similar DNA in our blood, you know, in dealing with China. So once, once the, uh, my uh, Japanese friends always, you know, told the, uh, you know, my American friends and then also the other uh, you know, colleagues, uh, South Korea will be in the uh, uh, orbit of China in the future. And then uh, South Korea is gonna be allied with, uh, uh, China in the future. However, I told I told them, I told them, you know, uh, South Korea is going to be the last country who succumb to the uh, you know uh, China's uh, pressure. Uh, this is what the history uh, 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 tells us. However, we must be wise, as uh, you know, Professor the uh, uh, you know Wang Jai uh, mentioned. Uh, we don't want just uh, simply, uh, you know, fight uh, with, uh, you know, uh, China. Uh, we want to have a good relationship with China. Also, we want China to be a part of international societies and also rule-based international order. So we will try to help the uh, United States and China uh, to find a way out how to, you know, coexist and how to, uh, you know, uh, help the other international society uh, do something, uh, you know, better and then also to improve our, you know, uh, relationship with the other, you know, middle powers and small powers uh, together with the United States and China. That's why I'm telling you, 
uh, South Korea will uh, is try to play a kind of very important bridging role uh, in between the uh, northern and the southern hemispheres. Uh, anyway, uh, this is an extremely difficult task for us. So uh, uh, we have to, you know, um, we need to, uh, you know, better communication uh, between among uh, countries in the world and uh, including the United States and China. So uh, we will also try to help the United States in you know, decipher the, uh, the uh, you know, uh, the Chinese uh, behaviors and the foreign policies. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kim. Uh, you mentioned that uh, this is not just a part of foreign policy. This is our survival policy, survival strategy, uh, which is true. And we, we should maintain good alliance with the US, but at the same time, we should not turn our back to China. So we have to maintain a delicately good relationship with both countries, okay? And uh, any other questions from the floor? Uh, there is another question from YouTube. I am a Hankook University of Foreign Stu Studies student majoring in, um, in uh, Malay, Indo Indonesian, and Chinese diplomacy and commerce. I'd like to ask Professor Wang a question. The professor emphasized that Korean diplomacy should focus on hard power as well as soft power. Can you give some examples of political, economic, or social policies uh, or soft power influence Korea can devise and exert? Uh, Jay, did you hear my question? Can you just uh, repeat the question again? I'm trying to get uh, what, uh, yeah, uh, what uh, the, the person is asking about. You, you get it? Do you want me to repeat it? Yes, please. Uh -huh. Okay. So uh, you emphasize Korean diplomacy should focus on hard power as well as soft power. Can you give some examples of political, economic, or social policies or uh, soft power influence Korea can devise and exert? And I think it's something to do with uh, your uh, mentioning earlier that the Korea has increasing soft power these days. But the mm -hmm. question is how to translate our soft power into the, um, you know, making policy impacts. And that has been also uh, one of the long, longest questions among the public diplomacy experts mm -hmm. that we've seen there is an increasing uh, popularity on Korean culture but when we conducted some SNS research or other related research, we discovered no connection between these two. You know, the, the, uh, the fans and supporters of Korean culture are the one group and the, the, they are not interested in foreign policy at all. So it, using this uh, soft power uh, doesn't actually, so far, doesn't actually help. Uh, strengthening our foreign policy goals or even public diplomacy goals. So mm -hmm. I think this question is related to uh, what you were mentioning earlier. Do you have any clue or suggestion for that? Yeah, uh, Professor Cho, you're, you're right on this as well. You know, I think that's uh, the big challenge is sometimes is for us to uh, connect the sort of the dots, uh, but we also know uh, you know the the broader recognition awareness uh, of a country like here, like of South Korea, uh, certainly helps, right? So uh, it doesn't hurt. Uh, in, uh, that's what we would assume, and I think that you know uh, that's probably uh, true. Um, so it perhaps it also has something to do with our assumption about our goals. What's the outcome of our public diplomacy? Uh, in each activities. And for the longest time, you know, our goals are uh, very, very uh, specific about, you know, we want people to you know, change their views and attitudes and, uh, and, and hopefully they're gonna, you know, uh, do something, right, to, on the behavioral side of it. I think that uh, we are increasingly moving also towards 
uh, the outcome uh, we sort of talk about already, it's a relation, relationship outcome. And so then how do we operationalize uh, what relationship outcome means? And one of the things that we can, we can operationalize is uh, the, 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 the networks that we established. So the networks establish, whether it's through pop culture or through think tank conversations, you know, policy elite uh, discussions, all these things. Um, uh, uh, yes, of course, uh, we also are interested in uh, the, the, the members of the network in terms of what is their attitudes, or what is, you know, uh, uh, what, 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 what they may do uh, concerning uh, US-Korea relations. Um, but in and itself, building the network, uh, it's, uh, has, has its value uh, because the network uh, can be activated uh, for a variety of uh, uh, situations. And I think then if we take uh, that perspective and I think that, yes, we may not be at this point, you know, see the direct outcome of people, you know, embracing uh, South Korean's pop culture, um, you know, to a certain kind of a policy objective uh, uh, South Korea, you know, wants to advocate. Um, how if, but if we even looking at, uh, you know, building this following of South Korean pop culture, if we look at uh, through an, building a network perspective, so maybe there's more things that we need to do uh, uh, to, to build up the network, right? It's not just uh, because people, you know, um, enjoy it, uh, the music and all that. So there, there, there could be uh, the sort of an, a, 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 an extra step uh, that we need to take uh, to, um, uh, uh, to really accomplish uh, a very specific uh, public, uh, public diplomacy uh, goal which is uh, to, uh, to develop uh, uh, a network of stakeholders. And I think if you think from that perspective, uh, uh, I think two things will kind of descend. A lot of the things that we, we, we are doing uh, has its own value. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we need to do more uh, to enhance these networks so that the values uh, can be activated um, you know, at various uh, points in time whenever it's needed. Jay, I absolutely agree with you that um, if we want to achieve something, certain public diplomacy goals in our short run, we don't get anyone, anything. But as you suggested, building network, I think will be paid off in the long run. And I, recently I had an experience, very interesting experience at our graduate school of international studies. Uh, we haven't seen many students who came to EVA because they were interested in uh, Korean wave. And I heard a lot of news from the foreign universities that most of the students who came to Korean studies program it, Germany, US, and other countries, they were all motivated by Korean culture. Mm -hmm. And then now we are started getting the international students from abroad who are motivated by Korean culture. So they spend their teenage days listening to Korean music and watching Korean drama. And then they went to Korean studies program in their country and then it took a few years to come to Korea at a graduate school. So always, and they are studying actually um, the, the international relations and Korean economics and other policy related courses. So it takes time that this uh, transfer the cultural power into the uh, policy influence. I think it takes time. So as Jay suggested, building network is I think the key factor in achieving public diplomacy goals. And I have uh, two more questions as we have 11 minutes left. Uh, let me introduce two more questions to Jay. And uh, one question is, you know, because you bolded it, the steps, because you bolded it, I, I can't read it. Don't, 
use the color or yes yes that's good um you presented on um, demographic changes in the u.s uh, and the, this this uh, student and wonders the um, whether the increasing proportion of Asians in the US will have a positive effect on Korea or it might cause a negative effect like you know Asian hatred these days that we are witnessing in the US. So what is your prospect? Hmm. This is an area that I do think that we need to uh, look into uh, more closely. Uh, because we haven't really looked at, you know, uh, as I was saying, um, like 10 years from now. Uh, if, in this case, we're talking about, you know, South Korean uh, public diplomacy in the US. Of course, you want to say, well, 10 years from now, what is the US, you know, <laughs> public's kind of a, a population makeup looks like, right? And, and what are the dynamics and what people's expectations and, uh, you know, so on and so forth. And, but we, we haven't really you know, had as much conversation about that. And um, um, so I cannot say for sure, I don't know, for instance, you're right. So as the country becomes more diverse and as the country, uh, uh, you know, uh, there's a growing uh, population of, uh, for Asian uh, uh, descent, uh, Asian heritage, uh, uh, does it help or does it doesn't help or does it even hurt, um, you know, uh, uh, international engagement uh, with uh, countries uh, like South Korea? And um, uh, that's a very interesting question. I, you know, I don't think we, we, we will take uh, necessarily take for granted, you know, and I said, oh, you know, they are of the Asian, you know, uh, uh, heritage, it will help. And, you know, I, I, wouldn't, um, I wouldn't give that uh, without sort of uh, taking a closer look. Um, and I also think that um, if you look at the US, you know, we haven't looked at this from the public diplomacy angle, but if you're just looking at uh, from the US domestic politics angle, from the domestic election angle, you will see that. Uh, it's far more uh, fluid and it's more dynamic than when you would think. Uh, and depending on the locations, look, depending on the regions. And so the US is a very big country, right? So um, um, hence, you know, I always say that uh, engaging American public is vitally important because American public uh, needs to uh, be engaged uh, on the world stage and be better informed. Um, uh, at the same time, uh, it's such a diverse country and it requires, uh, uh, you know, very discerning uh, approaches, uh, you know, as opposed to uh, kind of one size fit all. Probably increasingly so, uh, as I was presenting, uh, sort of the more the demographic changes, and uh, um, and so think of this. Uh, it is the United States, so there are, you know, <laughs> different regions and states. Um, um, so. Um, so I guess, you know, I, I, I haven't really answered your question directly only to say that we need to do more research, which is, uh, which is, which is my honest answer. Yeah, I understand. Uh, think about how many uh, different the national and ethnic, uh, the ethnicity exists in Asia. Asia is a huge, great continent. Right. And I, I like, for instance, uh, Professor, I sometimes like to use the example. It's, it's a hypothetical example, but it may also illustrate something. I was just saying that, for instance, um, British uh, culture has always enjoyed uh, tremendous popularity in the US. And my colleague, uh, Professor Nicole, can certainly also speak a lot on that as well. And uh, so one of the you know, um, most of popular uh, entertainment uh, products in recent years uh, is uh, Downton Abbey. Um, even though that was the most watched, I think, uh, TV series probably on the, on the public uh, broadcasting stations. Um, but in a classroom, actually, when I asked my students, 
a lot of them actually, <laughs> you know, didn't know um, about it or just, you know, never watched anything like that. So, so I think that you see that generational difference, uh, you know, uh, so Downton Abbey would certainly be a very good uh, British cultural export, uh, you know, um, among the many uh, cultural exports uh, from the UK. Uh, that has also very much influenced impact American culture industry. And, uh, uh, but at the same time, uh, would uh, in 20 years from now, would there be the same audience segment for Downton Abbey? Probably not. But would there be still people uh, continue to read and continue to um, put on shows, plays, performances, based on Shakespeare's plays? Probably yes. And so I think that, uh, so in that perspective, so there are certain, uh, you know, cultural <laughs> um, products, if you would, um, will la last, has, a, has lasting value and others don't because of the generational changes. And I, and I constantly think about, you know, uh, let's just say, you know, South Korean pop culture, right? So 10 years from now, 20 years from now, uh, what might be the things that, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the generations will be interesting. But I think to Professor Cho's point, because our younger generation are introduced to South Korean pop culture early on, so 10 years from 20 years from now, they will probably still uh, be following uh, that or at least uh, have a few of the connections to. Um, uh, so uh, anyways, I may digress a little bit, but I, but I just wanted to add this point. I don't know if the Downton Abbey <laughs> example makes any sense here. Okay, one final question is, uh, it's very similar to the questions earlier raised. So you, you, after listening to this question, you just conclude your remarks, okay? Uh, one final question is, um, Uh, in the meantime, there was another question, and you know, combining these two, uh, this one student is interested in what kind of PD practices or strategies can be take while we are maintaining good relationship with the current allies, and at the same time, uh, we when we are developing a new relationship with the um, another ally, and the. Uh, so another question is that, would you give more details about civic participation engagement in the PD in the US if possible? So um, combining these two, you can give a concluding remarks. Mm -hmm. The second question is about the city's participation, right? Yes, yes, in PD yes. activities. Yes, uh, we clearly see a growing um, uh, interest, uh, but also, um, uh, investment in energy at the city level, uh, because the cities, um, you know, uh, they can establish networks around the world. I think uh, climate is an issue that uh, uh, provide, uh, provides a, a very good platform for cities around the world to, to band together, uh, to advocate uh, policies and actions at the local level, and but collectively, uh, they can del uh, deliver a much broader impact. Um, so uh, I can speak about uh, cities in the US. Um, most cities now, increasingly, they have a more organized effort, uh, you know, at the local level, uh, you know, to look at this well from the international affairs uh, perspective, not just from the protocol side of it, because, uh, you know, cities need to uh, work with, for instance, um, you know, the, the consulates, whatever, uh, that are based there, uh, but also uh, actively seeking um, you know, cultural engagement, and uh, but also on the uh, uh, on the on the policy front. And so, one of the interesting questions that's uh, raised among the city um, sort of international affairs practitioners is uh, in what policy arenas cities can international issues cities can have most impact. And because, of course, cities are part of you know part of the sort of the uh, a, a nation's framework and a lot of foreign policy matters that uh, you know the national foreign ministry, uh, in the U.S. case, the State Department or administration, um, you know, defines the foreign policy towards certain countries. But there are other arenas, areas that cities can 
uh, play a more active role. So I think, uh, so when cities are actively thinking about that and, uh, and then putting the structure uh, uh, despite you know, limited resources. And I do think that uh, there's a lot going and then the cities uh, provides the kind of flexibility and then they are more pragmatic. Because sometimes at the national level, uh, when we are you know, uh, in uh, some of these uh, uh, nation, nation to nation um, geopolitical kind of uh, situations that uh, we oftentimes get stuck and we cannot move uh, you know, forward uh, in any meaningful way in a, in a very efficient manner. Uh, but cities can take steps to solve some of these uh, problems that uh, uh, with or without geopolitical struggle that uh, climate issues that we need to address, public health issues we need to address, you know, so, uh, and economic development uh, we need to address. And so I do think that uh, uh, there is a, a, you know, a, a very bright future uh, for uh, uh, diplomacy at the local level. Thank you very much. I like to give my uh, deepest appreciation to the students and participants who raised questions through the YouTube and the uh, discussions here, uh, Professor Kim and Professor Kadir. And above all, I like to, uh, uh, I am very much thankful to uh, Professor Jay Wang's insightful speech and also uh, very kind responses to the questions. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to uh, conclude the first session now. Thank you for your participation. Thank you very much. Thank you for paying attention. Uh, we will start session two with a 10 minute break. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, the session two will begin within minutes. Please take a seat. Session 2가 시작될 예정입니다. 모두 자리에 착석해 주시기 부탁드립니다. Distinguished guest, I ask that you please take your seats. Next session two will be held on Korea US public diplomacy strategy for peace and prosperity in East Asia. This session will be moderated by Professor Taehwan Kim of the Professor of Public Diplomacy at Korea National Diplomatic Academy. We welcome you with a big round of applause. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I am Professor Taehwan Kim uh, from the uh, Korea National Diplomatic Academy. The first session uh, was very interesting. The main topic was uh, the role of a Korea USPD public diplomacy, I mean, to strengthen alliance. And the second session, we actually going uh, one step up to the level of uh, region, not, not, not simply peninsula, but region, uh, whether it could be, could be Northeast Asia, East Asia, or uh, the Indo-Pacific at large. But then uh, it seems to me that East Asia, East, I mean, Asian region for that matter, Asia at large, appears to be at the critical juncture today. Uh, why, why do I think that way? Well, there are many <laughs> numerous factors that, that make really uh, the, the East Asian, uh, Asian, the uh, uh, Indo-Pacific uh, political situations very complicated, but then just to name a few, for, few first of all, uh, that I believe that uh, the Indo-Pacific is, uh, is uh, rapidly becoming these days a geopolitical cauldron uh, 
meaning that a space for you know, great power rivalry, particularly between the United States and China. And so the geopolitical rivalry is, uh, uh, is intensifying. And the second point is that particularly uh, uh, after the, uh, the Biden administration was uh, uh, inaugurated this year, the administration has put placed a great emphasis on uh, human rights and democracy in its in its uh, foreign policy. So uh, we see, I see, an intensifying uh, bifurcation of values, or what I would call blockage blockageization of values between liberalism centering around the United States on the one hand, and counter liberalism or anti liberalism centering uh, around China. So we have. Uh, bifurcation of values. And the third one is, uh, we all know that uh, we, we, we're witnessing the harsh rise of parochial nationalism in countries of the region. The nationalism, parochial nationalism uh, that has uh, long historical origins. And also it's based on, uh, on very painful historical collective memories. I mean, all those three things also already uh, make a, a political outlook of the reason very, you know, gloomy. <laughs> and, and I believe that uh, at, at this moment, the geopolitics in Asia, or for that matter, in, 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 the, in, the, in the Pacific, is no longer simply geographical or political, but also social cultural. So I think uh, against this uh, grimy, you know, outlook picture of uh, uh, Asian politics, I think it's, it's, it's really high time for us to uh, seriously reconsider the regional role of public diplomacy, not simply national role, the regional, what, what, what possibly could we do, the public diplomacy could do at the regional level, okay? how possibly the long, the allied partners, Korea and South Korea, do together to cope with the, the challenges emanating from the grim political outlook of uh, Asia. Okay. Then I think uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, probably one of the questions we will be dis discussing in this session. And for this purpose, we actually invited uh, four distinguished uh, scholars uh, two presenters are joining online from the United States, uh, one from uh, University of Southern California, one from Korea, the Jeju Peace uh, Development, uh, and two discussants. Uh, thankfully, they are physically uh, present here. Uh, uh, so uh, our first speaker will be uh, Nicholas Kong. He is a professor at the USC Center on Public Diplomacy. The call is, I think, uh, it's already online. And we all know that he's, uh, he's, uh, he's uh, one of the uh, renowned and authoritative uh, uh, scholars in the field of public diplomacy. And also he's a very prolific scholar. <laughs> and our uh, second uh, presenter from the side of Korea is uh, uh, Dr. Hanin Tech. He is uh, president of Jeju Peace Institute. He is uh, joining us uh, online. He's uh, physically currently in the United States now on his uh, business trip. And we have distinguished uh, uh, discussants, uh, Professor Xinhua Li from Korea University, University to my left, and uh, to my right, uh, Professor Chen Jae-sung from Seoul National University. Professor Chen is also a uh, professor of uh, the most distinguished Korean Association of uh, uh, Political Scientists, Korean Association for Political Science, International, International Studies, Korean Association for International Studies. Okay, good. So uh, we all together have 80 minutes for uh, assigned to this session. And uh, I'd like to give uh, a 15 minute each presenter. Uh, ideally, hopefully 15 minutes 
uh, presentation per person, per, per presenter, but uh, uh, realistically uh, maximum 20 minutes, no, no, no longer than 20 minutes, and 10 minutes each to our distinguished uh, uh, discussion. Is it, is, is it okay? So please join me welcoming the first presenter, uh, Professor Nicholas Call from uh, the University of Southern California. Nick, you ready? Yes, absolutely. Good, please. Okay, so um, just hold on a moment while I open up my presentation. And uh, uh, can you see it? Can you see my presentation? Yes. Good. Absolutely. Okay. Clear. Thank you. Well, um, what I want to do with my presentation is to um, actually flesh out what a regional public diplomacy might, might look like by adding uh, a, um, a dimension to uh, a term that I've been developing, which is reputational security. And, and I will explain what I, what I mean by that. Uh, and um, my contention is that it's time to think about collective reputational security. So one of the ways in which regions can work together is through uh, mutual reinforcement of, uh, of public diplomacy. And I'll, I'll explain exactly what I mean as I go along. First of all, I want to take a moment to give you my perspective on what I see is our moment of crisis right now. I want to critique the existing interpretations of the theory of soft power and of soft power as the dominant way of understanding public diplomacy and how this relates to region is, as, as you'll see, um, soft power emphasizes unilateral roles of countries rather than regional blocks or intersecting interests. It tends to uh, assume a sort of a zero sum game or competition between countries. I'll introduce the idea of collective reputational security and then make some cases of uh, collective public diplomacy action. Uh, I'll finish up by talking about how collective reputational security would relate to strategy. And my overall conclusion, you won't be surprised to hear, is that it's time to act, but more than this, time to act together. So first of all, our moment of crisis. Well, we live in uh, multiple crises right now. First of all, the media is in crisis as a result of the dislocation that's come from the introduction of social media and weaponization of media by hostile actors on the international stage. The transition to social media is, I think, inherently destabilizing in much the same way that the transition to radio broadcasting, to television, or even to the popular press was also destabilizing. Uh, I would argue that those technological transitions were causal factors in the world wars and made uh, the Cold War much worse. So I believe we should take uh, the problems with communication technology very seriously uh, right, right now. It, it, they could cause uh, disasters uh, uh, in the international uh, arena. I, I see uh, public susceptibility to these um, new media as being rather like the way in which when a new virus comes along, people have no immunity uh, to it. People don't know how to filter, how to understand messages coming through social media. On top of this, our politics is in crisis. We have a political gridlock in many countries around the world. Uh, we have a crisis in diplomacy where the nation state has uh, lost credibility on an awful lot of issues. And then at the same time, we're seeing the emergence of the public as a factor in foreign policy, which has given us the current attention, both to media and soft power in international relations. But we're basing a lot on soft power, but the soft power as a theory has its uh, problems. Uh, I, I am wholly um, in, uh, in agreement with Professor Nye and uh, his attention to the forces of attraction in foreign policy, what worries me is the way in which soft power has been interpreted in the marketplace of ideas, where there, it has this focus on the unilateral, on looking at individual excellence of countries as if there was some sort of um, uh, zero-sum uh, competition. 
uh, I, I would also say that uh, it tends to emphasize only the most successful countries. So we have the soft power 10, the soft power 30. What about uh, the rest of the, the, the world? How can we have a theory that doesn't incorporate 170 uh, other, uh, other countries? There's also a paradox within power that when you um, emphasize uh, building up uh, the power uh, of a country, uh, power itself can be a, a repellent or repulsive feature. Think of the story from the uh, um, Judeo-Christian Bible of David and Goliath. Uh, nobody ever cheers for Goliath. You always root for the smaller, less powerful uh, party. Uh, and um, uh, But this goes against the idea of always accumulating absolute strength to a single actor. Uh, I think that a, a, a beneficial soft power strategy should include empowering others. Also, unilateral uh, ideas of soft power emphasize uh, developing a personal image, uh, an image for uh, influence of others. And I think this is an unattractive thing in its own right. I, I, I point my students to the famous uh, American song by the singer Carly Simon, where she sings about a, a, an actor. You're so vain, you probably think this song is about you. I, I think that countries that spend all their time talking, emphasizing their own excellence um, are um, off-putting uh, to, to some international audiences. Some international images can actually get in the way of collaboration, and I see this as a problem uh, with the great campaign that has been advanced by uh, the place I, I'm originally from, uh, United Kingdom. Uh, a way around this has been to emphasize within a great paradigm the uh, openness to um, uh, to collaboration, so you can somehow get out of a, the, the blind alley of um, uh, talking about yourself um, and uh, undermining collaboration. But soft power tends to ignore problems of negatives and all countries have within them elements of their culture or elements of their behavior that they themselves find uh, troubling and that international audiences are off put by. Uh, I've been very interested recently in protests uh, against the, uh, within South Korea, of the emphasis on um, uh, uh, cosmetic surgery and uh, what some Korean feminists are saying is an oppressive uh, beauty images in, in Korean uh, society. And I think that that can undermine um, uh, the um, soft power of, of Korea as that aspect of Korean life becomes known to uh, foreign audiences. This is why, or these problems are why I proposed this idea of reputational security as a category. And um, I would define reputational security as that element of security which comes from having a good reputation. So the way in which reputation, reputational strength, uh, acts as a barrier uh, and an insulation against uh, bad things happening to you in the international environment. Uh, I think that the pandemic has deepened the need for reputational uh, security or to invest in reputational security. Many countries have had things happen which have uh, challenged their good reputation and even the excellent um, perception of South Korea's reaction to COVID had moments of reputational danger, uh, like when there was that um, outbreak in, in the church, um, which uh, I, I think played very badly overseas and seemed like a, a strange moment. We are seeing in the world today more and more problems, as Kofi Annan used to say, without passports. When problems don't have passports, when problems require collaborative transnational solutions, we need a different kind of approach, a collective approach. And I think this uh, applies also to uh, soft power. That's why I'm talking about collective reputational security. What is collective security to start with? Well, that's when countries get together to build a, uh, a, a better defense uh, against problems in the world. The term was used, maybe overused, uh, in the 1930s to describe a, an, an active um, uh, response to the uh, 
uh, dictator powers, you could think of it as being akin to the three musketeers, the idea of one for all and all for one. Uh, and of course, this is an important part of the history of uh, Korea. Uh, think of the uh, collective uh, United Nations uh, commitment to the uh, Korean War. We're all thinking today about regional tasks and collective projects, what countries can do together. So I'm suggesting that what part of some of those projects can be in the information space, working together, for example, to build uh, free media, to build stable and reliable media platforms that can restore integrity to media space would be a collective project. Working to build mutual understanding, not just bilateral, uh, mutual understanding, but trans-regional understanding, and working together for what I call media disarmament. When something is weaponized in the international system, we work to uh, negotiate around that weapon and somehow neutralize it or at least uh, tone it down. It's time to have that kind of project around our stereotypes, around the demonization and uh, undermining that takes place in information space. Uh, bottom line is we need to work together to build better realities. The best images in world affairs come from realities, not just from empty claims made by marketers. Uh, I think there's uh, an op opportunity to use multilateral educational exchange to begin to build shared solutions to the problems we face. And it's a great rationale for seeking to understand each other, to actually say, well, if we're talking to each other regionally, we have an opportunity to increase our mutual defense. But it's also an opportunity to understand ourselves. And I'm, I'm, I'm very struck by a line uh, from the English poet, Rudyard Kipling, uh, who said, and what should they know of England who only England know, meaning if you only know your own country, then you don't really know your own country. You have to know friends, uh, comparators, in order to really understand uh, and improve the place where you are living. And my final point about this would be, if we understand one another, uh, we can also advise one another, guide one another, and help uh, save one another from some of the own goals that come up just in the um, uh, natural run of politics. We need our friends uh, to uh, point out when uh, something we're doing is uh, counterproductive. So what might this actually, uh, or where do we actually see cases of collective uh, reputational security? Well, one place we see it is in uh, the, the frameworks out there of bilateral uh, exchange treaties where countries commit to developing their uh, relationships. And we've always, uh, we've, uh, I think, heard a little bit about that from uh, Jay Wong's presentation. We've had countries collaborating in listening projects. There used to be uh, a, a, a collaboration between the US and UK in uh, understanding radio audiences um, in the Eastern Bloc. There are now joint cultural platforms. The European Union has launched a joint cultural diplomacy initiative called UNIC, where the countries agree that what they should be working together to promote is not the excellence of one single country, but rather shared projects that show the strength of uh, the ideas, the European ideas. Uh, collective Counter disinformation projects are another uh, thing that the European Union is doing. And I think it's very important to work together to publicize and attempt to uh, publicize um, destabilizing of the news uh, environment and uh, work together to um, uh, flag um, uh, problems in, in our, um, in our, our uh, uh, news media. There are practical partnerships that are already applied uh, to uh, particular problems uh, with a public element. Um, the uh, Asia Pacific Alliance for Disaster Management would be one of those. Uh, and sometimes um, you see cross-cultural collaboration just happening 
organically, uh, like the way in which uh, in LA, there's a fusion between uh, Korean and Mexican food happening that nobody planned, uh, but it's a great way of showing how um, things can come together in an exciting way. And then uh, we can see a tradition of friends helping friends to diminish negatives. Um, it was really important that uh, both friends and adversaries of the United States pushed back against American racism in the 1950s and 60s and helped American presidents like Eisenhower and Kennedy understand that they couldn't represent the free world at the level they wanted to and still have um, uh, outrageous displays of racism and uh, second-class citizenship for African-Americans built into the American legal system. Uh, and uh, so I, I, I see that uh, uh, friends correcting friends as being a very important part of what we're, we're talking about here. Uh, a clue um, in uh, the need for collective public diplomacy action is in the way in which hostile countries attack any idea of collective action, mock alliances and attempt to separate countries out because they're easier to confront when they are acting alone. The nightmare of our adversaries is that we will understand and connect to one another and coordinate. So collective reputational security and strategy as I'm moving to a conclusion. I see this as a mechanism to promote the health of regional alliances as a way um, of uh, moving forward. We can look for single issue um, uh, groupings uh, around uh, particular areas of concern and have multiple uh, variants of these groupings. I, um, I, I think that the uh, current uh, initiative between US, Australia and the UK is an example of just one of these groupings, but there's opportunities uh, for many more to exist in a, in a kind of a web of uh, alliances and relationships. Um, you can also look at the, uh, the uh, CPTPP as being an, an important uh, uh, grouping, uh, allowing uh, more to be done and uh, uh, a way in which a collective can be uh, developed. And with these multiple connections, we have an opportunity to have a soft balancing of the hegemons who are looking to push people around, by which I mean uh, China. We can also look to reduce tensions with our adversaries when the time is right uh, by having collective approaches to uh, mutual understanding and uh, exchange to uh, reduce um, the um, uh, misunderstandings in those relationships where they exist. So my conclusion, it's time to act together. I see great hope in the attention right now to reputation. The UK has institutionalized this with what's called the fusion doctrine, uh, writing British soft power activities into the mainstream agenda of foreign policy and saying uh, the economy, soft power, military are all interlinked. Uh, we can't uh, think of them as being uh, separate, but have to work to build all of those elements. Maybe it's time for a fusion doctrine for the Asia Pacific. Um, we live in an era of global challenges, so obviously we need global solutions. Obviously, this is no era for countries to go it alone. What I like about uh, the idea of a collective security or a reputational security is that as soon as we start talking about security, then um, the uh, Treasury Department can see the logic of what we're talking about. And sometimes public diplomacy has been uh, presented merely as like an optional extra, as something that's like icing on the cake, a little extra to make a country seem uh, even more uh, attractive than it already is. I'm talking, uh, when we address issues of security, I think it's, uh, it's much more resonant with the people who pay the bills. Uh, I think we should have a challenge fund for collective work to actually make funding available for projects that work at this regional level and learn from the avenues of attack. Think about the, the things that are being targeted by our adversaries and be inspired to do something going in the other direction. My final point is public diplomacy is an essential tool for the 21st century. I'm so pleased 
that there is systematic attention year after year after year to public diplomacy coming from uh, Korea. And we all know the best way to begin in public diplomacy is to listen to each other. And so I applaud the elements of listening uh, implicit in these public diplomacy initiatives. Thanks so much for your, repu for your uh, attention. Uh, you're welcome to email me at uh, carl at usc.edu. Follow me on Twitter at, at Nick Cull, And I have a, a podcast with Simon Anholt called People Places Power. And always glad when people are listening in to that. Uh, that's the end of my formal remarks, but I'll, obviously I'm looking forward to the uh, wider conversation. Thanks for your uh, attention. Well, thank you very much, Nick. Models for your uh, punctuality and, and and particularly for your 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 uh, providing very very interesting uh, concept of uh, uh, collective reputation and security. I think it's a not only uh, a great uh, potential as a theoretical theoretical notion, but also uh, I believe it contains a huge potential of uh, of uh, practices. Okay. Uh, as a moderator, I wouldn't uh, spend our uh, precious time in summarizing uh, presenters uh, presentations because uh, the, I mean, the, as you know, the uh, close uh, next presentation is uh, so, you know, clear and crispy. So uh, without further ado, I would like to go directly over to our second presenter. Intech, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Thank you very okay, much. Good. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Let me Please share, come forward. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Let me share my uh, screen first. Okay, yeah. Um, thank you. By the way, Intec, yeah, thank yeah. you very much for joining us from the United States online. <laughs> okay. it's, it's my, my pleasure. And and when uh, Professor Kim asked me to make a presentation on uh, South Korea's public diplomacy for regional stability and uh, pro prosperity, I said yes, I was happy to uh, discuss that issue. But if I knew what I, what I was getting into, I would have said no, uh, because um, at, as we discussed at the beginning of this uh, session, uh, South Korea didn't really think much, didn't think much in terms of regional stability or, or regional uh, prosperity. It, it usually thought in terms of uh, bilateral stability, stability in bilateral relations, or at best, uh, Korean Peninsula, but it didn't really think much in terms of a region. Uh, Northeast Asia was, the, I think, the uh, biggest region uh, it could, uh, it, it, it really thought of as, a, as a, the target of its, uh, its foreign policy. Uh, with, with that, I'd like to start my presentation. Um, South Korea uh, was poor, uh, was stricken country, but it is now an uh, uh, advanced economy. And also it, it sees itself as a middle power and seeks to promote not just its national interests, but also uh, wider uh, interests such as regional stability and uh, prosperity. And in recent decades, uh, especially within the past four or five years, South Korea has, has been uh, advancing multilateral cooperation as its uh, preferred approach to uh, regional stability and prosperity. Uh, why has uh, South Korea chosen multilateral cooperation to promote uh, regional stability and prosperity? And why and how uh, does it use public diplomacy to, to enhance multilateral cooperation and thereby uh, regional stability and prosperity? These are the two questions that drive my uh, short presentation, hopefully short pre presentation. Uh, while regional stability and prosperity may be universally uh, worthy goals, not every country seriously strive to achieve them. <clears throat> One reason for their inactivism is their limited power. Small powers, which South Korea was once, concentrate on uh, their resources to protect their national interests, rather than spending them on uh, promoting uh, wider goals, such as regional stability and, and, and so on. Now South Korea sees itself as a middle power and, and begin to use its muscles 
uh, to promote regional stability and prosperity. Interestingly, interestingly, in promoting uh, regional stability and prosperity, South Korea empathizes uh, multilateral uh, cooperation. Why multilateral cooperation? It is not actually difficult to see why South Korea prefers uh, multilateral cooperation. Take um, regional stability, for instance. Uh, existing approaches to peace and security are becoming increasingly costly and, in, and, and irrelevant. Um, uh, ROK US Alliance, which is the cornerstone of South Korea's uh, security, was effective in deterring North Korea uh, from launching conventional attack on the South, but it is now becoming increasingly irrelevant and costly in uh, deterring the North from launching a cyber attacks on South Korea or nuclear attacks uh, on, on South Korea or even on, on the United States. Uh, if and when North Korea's I ICDMs or SLDMs can reach a US mainland, then uh, the whole credibility of US-Korea alliance and also the very existence of US-Korea alliance will be uh, put into question. So currently, current, the, the existing arrangement to promote and peace and security on the Korean Peninsula uh, is, is growingly weakening right now. And even if an, an effective ROK-US alliance is somehow possible, I think that it is still uh, unable to force the North Korea to de denuclearize or, or, it, or does it, it doesn't provide incentive to, uh, to North Korea to implement regime change. On the contrary, uh, the past behavior by the North indicates that a stronger US-South uh, US Korea alliance is likely to harden rather than soften North Korea's stance. What is more, what is more, efforts to strengthen or update US-Korea alliance in response to new threat uh, from the North, uh, agitate China and exacerbate uh, the security dilemma between the United States and North Korea, as well as among the United States and China and, and South Korea. Third is, is a good example of, of the security dilemma uh, deepened by uh, uh, our response to uh, North Korea's uh, nuclear capability. So the limits of ex existing uh, realist security mechanisms have led South Korea to look for alternative approaches uh, and, and inspired by the success of the Helsinki process and the end of Cold War in Europe, South Korea sees multilateral cooperation as a supplement or even alternative to traditional uh, bilateral uh, approach. An, an interesting and surprising fact uh, about South Korea's pursuit of regional stability and prosperity is its extensive use of public diplomacy to promote multilateral cooperation. Uh, take uh, the, uh, President Park Geun-hye's multilateral cooperation initiative, for example. Uh, President Park argued that Asia suffered from Asian paradox or the disconnect between growing economic interdependence on the one hand and the backward and polit backward political security cooperation on the other hand. As a remedy, President Park proposed North East Asia Peace and Cooperation Initiative or NEPSI. And the NEPSI is a process to build trust and promote cooperation with the, with the United States and other North East Asian countries. Starting with soft issues such as the environment, and then slowly progressing toward heavier issues such as nuclear weapons. In order to gather support for the NEPSI from countries in the region, Park Geun-hye government uh, engaged in official government to government diplomacy with individual countries. It also started effort to secure support from people outside the government in other words, foreign public. Uh, it launched a public diplomacy for the NEPC. Bakunek government, for instance, organized conferences, most notably Northeast Asia Peace and Cooperation Forum, Dongbuga Pyeongha Hemlock Forum in Korean, 
with uh, foreign expert and professionals, and also ran programs such as public private network project, Mingguan Network Kuchuksao in Korean, to build a network with the private sector expert and professionals in Northeast, uh, in Northeast Asia. Munjain's government uh, also proposed Northeast Asia plus community of responsibility uh, 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 policy, Dongbuga plus Chekin Dongdongche policy, as his major foreign policy initiative. President Moon's initiative consists of two pillars the pillar of prosperity, Bonyongichuk, and the pillar of peace, Pyongwaichuk. Uh, the former, in turn, consists of a uh, new southern policy. Xin Nambang Jongchek and the new Northern policy, Xin Bukbang Jongchek, while the latter consists of uh, Northern Northeast Asia Peace and Cooperation Platform, Dongbuga Pyongha Hyamnya Platform. It is remarkable that uh, President Moon has inherited uh, President Park's NEPSI in the form of Northeast Asia Peace and Cooperation Platform, platform and continues to hold the annual Northeast. Asia Peace and Cooperation Forum, uh, continuously engaging with, with uh, private sector experts and profession, professionals uh, in, around the region. It is also uh, notable that uh, Northeast Asia uh, Peace and Cooperation Forum has been taking place every year since 2014, despite the change in, of the government in 2017, as well as the COVID-19 pandemic, which forced many conferences to be canceled or postponed. Uh, the following two slides show uh, what the annual uh, NAPC forum uh, has been about. It has consistently dealt with issues of peace, cooperation, and prosperity in Northeast Asia. Uh, those session topics were more specific and, and also more diverse, including nuclear safety, energy security, cyberspace, confidence building, and trilateral cooperation, and, and, and so on. So why public policy, public diplomacy mattered so much uh, multilateral cooperation? When, first, when South Korea first set its, uh, its eyes on multilateral cooperation, initially it tried to emulate the European style of multilateral cooperation, where ambassadors and their political principles play uh, a major role. But it has been hard for South Korea to emulate European style multilateral cooperation in, in Northeast Asia. Uh, probably given the differences in history and culture and also regional international relations. So if multilateral cooperation is going to take place and take, and, and, and take root, the momentum may need to come from, may need to come strongly from uh, the private sector, not from the government. This is where uh, South Korean, uh, Southeast Asian experience becomes relevant. And, uh, and public diplomacy becomes important. While overshadowed by uh, European experience, Southeast Asia is also a very successful case in multilateral cooperation. And, and at the beginning of 1990s, there was almost no multilateral security cooperation in, in Southeast Asia. But now, a war among ASEAN countries is almost unthinkable due to multiple layers of security, security cooperation that exists between ASEAN countries, ASEAN countries. So while Europe is uh, and all will remain as an in inspiration for multilateral cooperation for South Korea, Southeast Asia may be actually uh, more relevant uh, for North uh, as a model uh, for North for South Korea as South Korea try to uh, promote uh, regional multilateral cooperation in. In, the, in Northeast Asia, thereby promote uh, uh, re regional stability and, and uh, prosperity. South Korea, just like uh, uh, Southeast Asia, just like South Korea, lacked strong multilateralism, but has managed to achieve 
the security community and economic community. And studies have shown that a strong track to diplomacy and vibrant epistemic community uh, were the key to South Asia's success, success in multilateral cooperation. So uh, unlike, uh, but unlike Southeast Asia, epistemic community in, in Northeast Asia is weak and fragmented along the national lines. And this underdevelopment of transnational epistemic community in Northeast East Asia is a setback to multilateral, multilateral cooperation in Northeast Asia. However, it is important to, to realize that Southeast Asia did not have a vibrant track to diplomacy until the early 1990s. The lesson from Southeast Asian experience is that transnational epistemic community can develop over a relatively short period of time and a newly formed epistemic community can have a big impact. Apparently, this lesson has been well taken by President Park Geun-hye and also President uh, Moon Jae-in's government who have continued to engage with private sector professionals and experts through NAPC forums and public-private uh, network project. Uh, uh, and uh, blatantly showing uh, uh, the slide on Southeast Asia. Okay, uh, this is uh, my last part, uh, the importance and limits of forum uh, diplomacy. So while official diplomacy between Northeast Asian countries is often uh, dysfunctional, uh, uh, public diplomacy has become an important supplement to or even substitute for official diplomacy. And the primary public diplomacy tool for promoting South Korea-led multilateral cooperation has been forum diplomacy. Before the first uh, NAPC forum in 2014, annual conferences engaging foreign public, uh, especially for the expert and private sector pro professionals in Northeast East Asia have been uh, fewer and far between. Uh, but the continuous hosting of NAPC forum and the public uh, private network project is a sign that the forum diplomacy has come of age in Southeast Asia. And also the making uh, the Northeast Asia peace and cooperation platform as one of the three pillars of the Northeast Asia plus community of respons responsibility initiative, another indication that uh, South Korea now uh, see recognized the power and importance of epistemic community as a critical target of public diplomacy and also an enabler of multilateral cooperation. The South Korea now sees a public uh, uh, epistemic community as an important target of, of public diplomacy and, uh, because they enable multilateral cooperation. And they learned this from the experience of Southeast, Southeast Asia, which was another successful case of multilateral cooperation. And, and because of multilateral cooperation, there is now regional stability and prosperity in Southeast Asia uh, to the extent that it didn't exist 30 or 40 years ago. But Northeast Asia is not Southeast Asia, even though they are similar, but there are differences. For, first of all, uh, unlike, in, unlike in, in Southeast Asia, we have uh, publics that are not, uh, that cannot be easily uh, access, that are not easily uh, approachable. For instance, uh, the public in Northeast Asia, in North, North Korea, I don't know whether we have any means to, to uh, conduct public diplomacy uh, toward them, and nor uh, am I sure that they have, uh, they have any meaningful influence on foreign policy making in Northeast Asia. I can, even though the degree is a little bit different, I can say that similar limitations exist in publics in China and also in, in, in Russia. So while public diplomacy 
is a promising new tool for multilateral cooperation and eventually for regional stability and regional prosperity. Northeast Asia may not be the best place that it can be, uh, it can be applied. When official, when official relations are not favorable, uh, to the extent that official diplomacy is not practical, public diplomacy is also likely to be difficult. In such cases, in such cases, improving official relations is a precondition for effective uh, public uh, diplomacy. Uh, public diplomacy cannot and perhaps should not uh, replace official diplomacy. Even for South Korea, uh, which is now a mature middle power, Promoting regional stability and, and prosperity in Northeast Asia uh, through public diplomacy or any other means is still a very tall order. When the government changes at every five years or less and the officials rotate at every two years or less and promoting regional stability and, and prosperity uh, becomes even harder. However, promising uh, the forum diplomacy maybe or will will become uh, thank you uh, thank you very much thank you thank you very much uh intact uh well, his focus is on is on on forum diplomacy uh particularly northeast asia uh, peace and cooperation forum uh, launched back in 2014 in which i was personally uh, in one way or another <laughs> involved and I would like to use this opportunity to let you know that actually the NAP forum, Northeast Asia Peace and Cooperation Forum this year, uh, co-hosted by Korea National Diplomatic Academy and, and Ministry of Foreign Affairs will be uh, starting tomorrow until uh, the day of the, uh, tomorrow, today, today, today conference. All right. Uh, this. This was simply a uh, public relations uh, <laughs> announcement. <laughs> All right, Xinhua, uh, could I ask you to be the first runner? Thank you. Please uh, uh, join me welcoming Yi Xinhua, Professor Yi Xinhua. Thank you very much. Well, it is widely and commonly known that public diplomacy is a policy tool of promoting soft power. And in that context, I think the two gentlemen in this panel are talking about public diplomacy is a useful tool for collective reputation security for Dr. Kerr and multilateral cooperation, particularly regional multilateral cooperation uh, for President Han. So both somewhat discussed roles and significance and limitation of public diplomacy in the current international society where security, diplomacy, and economic and social phenomena encompass a variety of issues and actors beyond state actors alone are increasingly uh, very complex. In particular, I understand both uh, presenters uh, commented on the kind of entanglement of economic and demographic, cultural, and although both of them didn't mention, I'm sure they may mean it as well, for technological changes and their impact on public diplomacy, particularly their impact on international and the regional peace security. And for that, I think a President Han's focusing on Korea-US relationship and East Asian geopolitics uh, in terms of uh, evolution of public diplomacy is very well taken at this time. President Han, you mentioned that multilateral cooperation is important for regional peace and security, especially for uh, middle powers like South Korea because the existing realist mechanism uh, for maintaining peace and security in this region is too costly and uh, kind of irrelevant. I, so here I have uh, four points. Well, some are related to the Dr. Kerr as well. Number one, where is the middle power ownership? What I'm saying is 
why I, I agree with President Han's argument that Korea is increasingly uh, uh, considering multilateral cooperation as a kind of supplementary or alternative way to traditional bilateral relationships, which is mostly inspired by the Europe's Helsinki process and the uh, post Cold War EU processes. I also agree with him arguing that the developmental process of multilateral cooperation in Southeast Asia can be a better fit or lesson uh, or role model than European cases in many ways for the situation in Northeast Asia in South Korea, including South Korea. Still, Korea's, I would say, quoting what you said, multilateralist approach discussed by you focus on cooperation between middle powers who wish to gain uh, or secure niche issues or gain uh, leverage or momentum uh, from the influence of the great powers. But as you know, your, that argument probably need to be a bit more updated in light of uh, ongoing multilateral approach. Here, I didn't say multilateralist approach, but I said multilateral approach. Um, the particularly so-called democratic alliance led by the United States, such as Quad, Five Eyes, or AUKUS, or more recently, vis-a-vis -vis Chinese led One Belt and One Road strategy and various regional initiatives including RCEP and, uh, and others. In this case, as we all know, originally, multilateralism was the preferred principle and method of middle powers. But recently, particularly as the US-China strategic competition for hegemony intensified in all direction, the two great powers are very, very actively uh, using the term multilateralism or multilateral approach as a diplomatic and security means to increase their side in international relations. Then while we here talk about multilateral cooperation or public diplomacy for multilateral cooperation is very much to do with middle powers gathering. And also Dr. Kerr, you show us this, uh, like a CPTPP, big US here and all middle powers on the other hand, right? But those things cannot explain current uh, like uh, reality of the region in Indo-Pacific because uh, now like a uh, big powers or superpowers uh, try to use multilateral approaches. So kind of my questions to both to Dr. Kerr and President Han is how we can define more middle power ownership in this like a uh, quickly changing world. Like uh, do we have to follow like a superpower led multilateral gatherings to secure our survival, or we still have to find some niche or like a leverage or rooms for us middle powers alone to do something in response to the superpower uh, the pressures. The secondly, I would like to talk about uh, the role of the epistemic community what President Han very nicely uh, addressed. Yes, I fully agree with President Han's analysis that role of the private sector, especially the epistemic community like us, is very important to pursue uh, the like, uh, public diplomacy. But you said uh, while multilateralism in Southeast Asia wasn't that good or strong, but since 1990, because of those epistemic communities greatly contribute to multilateral cooperation in Southeast Asia, therefore we Northeast Asia uh, take a lesson from them. But I think the problem is not lack of epistemic community in Northeast Asia. Just for example, uh, in the case of the Japan, they have uh, so many think tank, so-called epistemic community, both within Japan and outside uh, the Japan, including Washington DC. And given size and influence of those Japanese, um, like a think tank do something as a public diplomacy is humongous, which cannot be compared with the Southeast Asia. But I think the problem is our, I mean, Chinese, Korean or Japanese uh, community is 
if I can borrow the term from Dr. Kerr, the go it alone. I think we just do it by, by ourselves. So interregional epistemic community is like highly lacking in Northeast Asia. Therefore, I think if we just simply say how we can develop the epistemic community is not enough, but we have to say how these three countries can do something together and then to making so-called interregional epistemic community. Otherwise, I think our each epistemic community can be easily politically used by each government. Because I think we tend to be very critical of uh, like uh, China or Japan or Korea respectively. Therefore, I think we have to think about how we can make regional common identity that required to overcome the deep-seated distrust, hostility in terms of our history and territory. The third, I just want to say about the region. I think our chair, no, Professor Kim Tae-wan has mentioned about the Indo-Pacific, but, but neither of the two panelists to, appears to focusing on Indo-Pacific. I think that is a very important terminology to understand regional peace and security in this time. What I'm saying is the strategic focus shifted from the Asia Pacific to the Indo-Pacific due to the US active push uh, against the rise of China. But uh, the, the panelists are still discussing regional multilateral cooperation in terms of Northeast Asia, East Asia, or in the Asia Pacific. So Korea's regional multilateral security initiative has been focused on cooperation between Northeast Asian countries or East Asian countries, the regional cooperation, including Southeast Asia. In this case, the whether regional multilateral cooperation can be fostered and developed depends on whether the encouraging regional and multilateral cooperatives in Northeast Asia or East Asia will be compatible with the liberal international order in the US-led Indo-Pacific multilateral alliance framework. Therefore, I, have, I think we have to have uh, some kind of idea. Then I would like to uh, raise the questions to Dr. Kerr and President Han how we can balance between emerging regional multilateral architecture or multilateralist architecture on one hand, and then uh, how we can join in US-led uh, liberal international order style, like a democratic alliance or multilateral alliance, how we can balance those things and how those can be compatible. I think that is a key uh, to see whether our, our I call multilateral approach as a public diplomacy uh, will be successful or not. Last but not least, I am more than fully agree with the President Han's emphasis on the importance of forum diplomacy. Uh, in particular, in case of Korea, as President Han mentioned, national policy and relation with other countries change according to the change of government and leaders. So even if the forum goes well, the relationship between country is not sure. But you, it, while you're emphasizing importance of forum diplomacy, you said improving official diplomacy between government is the prerequisite for uh, advancing public diplomacy and including forum diplomacy. In this case, I think it is somewhat contradictory to say this while saying that public diplomacy, including forum diplomacy is increasingly important and the forum diplomacy require like a public, I'm sorry, official diplomacy first. So then, when official diplomacy is bad, very bad, what can be effectively achieved through public diplomacy and ultimately can be helpful to official diplomacy and how should it be pursued? So that's kind of the, my comment, last comment and question. And since I spent much time, very quickly to Dr. Kerr, you mentioned about what Marie, uh, Teresa uh, May, prime, then prime minister, you, the UK prime minister, Teresa May was mentioned about so-called fusion security. But, and then you say it's the importance of those, those different issues uh, have to be mingled together to promote the security. But some criticizing by the UK and the Westerns, I, I, I read, fusion security appears to be confusion security because they cannot make any clear cut division between the public and official, uh, official things. So correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but I think this is very interesting, uh, interesting uh, uh, terminologies, but probably you have a, a reason uh, or considerations to including the term fusion security here. So since you mentioned about fusion security for the Asia Pacific or Indo-Pacific, 
uh, please tell me how they can be utilized to promote the public diplomacy in this region. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Xinhua. Uh, Jia Sung? Thank you very much. We do have a uh, time constraint, yeah, just for sure. your information. <laughs> sure, 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 sure. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's okay. I'll be quick and short. Thank you very much for two excellent uh, presentation. So let me directly go into the discussion first. I want to give more time to Dr. Cole by asking questions. I want to uh, delve into the more concrete concepts, uh, which is very interesting in uh, Professor Cole's uh, presentation. First, I want to pay attention to the concept of paradox of soft power. Uh, that's very interesting because the apparent implication of soft power is that soft power is based on universal values rather than national interests and should not collide with other countries' interests in a direct way. But the reality is, is the opposite uh, because the temptation for the government to use the soft power, especially the achievement of private sector in the area of culture and entertainment is inevitably growing. So even though the nature of popularity of cultural soft power is far from a distinct political purpose, the visibility and appeal of those cultural powers are penetrating. But too much politicized soft power to enhance national power rather than to emphasize universal value is damaging ultimately both to the government and to the private sectors. Uh, for example, in South Korea's case, there are some temptation for South Korean governments to use the achievement of South Korean public, uh, I mean, the private sector's uh, culture achievements in enhancing South Korea's national interests. So the question is, uh, you wanna tell more about the paradox of soft power and how can avoid this paradox, which will be uh, ultimately harmful for all the actors. Second, again, very interesting concept, reputational security. So I wanna ask more about the contents and resources of reputation. Uh, in the scholarship of international relations, reputation has been dealt with in a, a comprehensive way. But uh, as far as I know, there is a scarce link between reputation and security. Uh, now in the current international relations, there is a very high, very uh, rapidly developing discourse competition about the desirable future international order, especially between the United States and China. Uh, they're trying to have more reputation uh, for their uh, visions and designs for the uh, future international, as Professor Lee uh, talked about in a very concrete way. Uh, the Biden administration uh, suggested that uh, America is back, the reinvigoration of the liberal international order in China is, is suggesting the so-called Chinese dream. Uh, we don't know the exact content of it, but we can guess. We have a vague projection that in China, there is a hierarchical authoritarian and, and digitalized uh, censoring type of uh, political regime inside China, which will be projected into the international arena when China becomes a hegemonic power. Uh, so there is a competition uh, about the future of the international order. The Biden administration has a burden of uh, changing the impression that America is pursuing its own interest during the Trump administration. So we cannot uh, actually believe in the project of both countries as a, a middle power in East Asia. So how can uh, reputation, uh, how is reputation is related to uh, this discourse competition regarding international order and how can South Korea devise the third model uh, which maybe selectively observe the positive aspects of two giants. Uh, can we have promote, can we uh, promote the insights from other media policies as you, as, as you uh, said in the section of a collective reputational security. So the third question will be related to collective uh, reputational security. Uh, there is always a uh, issue of collective action problem in middle power uh, collective action. There should be a leader and there is differences in interest structure of different middle powers. Now it's uh, the interest structure of Asian middle power uh, is diverging because you know every Asian country has have different interest structure. 
related to uh, the relationship with China and the United States. So if we wanna have a collective reputational security, we have to take uh, different infrastructure of middle powers into account. And we have to have some kind of common vision, uh, common uh, you know, projection of the future uh, world order. How can we achieve that? How can we achieve the collective vision for the future order uh, to enhance the so-called you know, collective reputational security? I am not sure that I understood your uh, ideas clearly by uh, hearing your presentation and reading your PPT. Uh, if I'm wrong, please correct me and, and give me some more concrete explanations. Very short, uh, two short questions to Professor Han. Uh, one is what will be the role of European powers in uh, enhancing Asian uh, cooperation? Because as we already witnessed, the participation of uh, the Great Britain, the, the, the UK and France, uh, Netherlands and uh, Germany in the common military uh, drill in Indo-Pacific is growing. So there should be some role for European powers in our, in South Korea's design for the future forum to uh, enhance the regional uh, international relations, I mean, the cooperation. Uh, the second, what will be the role of the private actors in our uh, ideas for uh, regional uh, cooperation. We already touched upon the idea of epistemic community, uh, but there are more and more actors because we are in the middle of the so-called weaponizing interdependence. So there are uh, you know, poli political and economic actors with diverging interests. So we have to have some kind of inclusive order uh, to give chance to uh, those actors some uh, voices. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jae Sung. Uh, two, you know, uh, professors actually raised uh, uh, very, very important and interesting questions. But then, you know, because we have a very serious time issue, time constraint issue, we have uh, less than ten minutes left. So that I think it's uh, it's actually presenters' market. <laughs> I mean, although we have uh, uh, very good uh, questions, but then uh, presenters uh, they selectively answer the questions of. Uh, his uh, preference. <laughs> uh, less than less than five minutes. Five minutes. Less than five minutes per, per presenter. Uh, Nick, would you please come well, forward? Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for these excellent questions, which I, I think I'll take them more as comments as I revise um, and, de and develop my concept. So I'm very pleased to, to have those. Um, I, a part of what I'm getting at, and, and I, I, I should say, um, that uh, President Hahn's remarks about um, uh, uh, about um, uh, epistemic communities are exactly the sort of thing that I'm that, that I'm talking about, and investing in building epistemic communities is one of the mechanisms that that, that I think leads to a collective uh, this kind of collective reputational security or. Uh, um, uh, so I feel we're, we're um, on the same page. Um, the bottom line of what I'm talking about is that reputation rests not on image, but on, uh, on reality. And if we want better, uh, image, better images, uh, we need to actively work to remove uh, the things that are seen by others as negatives. And this means an emphasis on human rights, uh, on helping one another to ease our uh, social problems. And um, I, I think um, the kind of policy discussions should be, um, should be uh, part, of, part of this. Um, and um, I um, appreciate um, the uh, relevance of, of uh, media here, uh, and I think a collective emphasis on free media, promoting access to media, is not only healthy for the development of the various regions that we need to think about, uh, it's also quite clearly what our adversaries do not want to happen. Um, they are obviously looking for divided media and unreliable media, because when your media isn't reliable, you trust the strongest person in the room. And if you work for the strongest person in the room, why would you want 
uh, any anything else to and uh, anything else to um, matter. Um, uh, you were speaking about uh, how reputation has developed in uh, international relations up to this point, and my feeling is that. Um, the study of reputation in international relations has tended to focus on the predictability of international behavior, on how people expect a country to act uh, and would go into whether or not they're going to um, uh, bluff, whether or not they, they uh, are going to be, how forceful will they be? And uh, I feel that we need to rescue uh, reputation from that kind of uh, rather narrow understanding and think of it much more broadly. And I'm not put off by um, the uh, mockery of fusion doctrine in some sections of the British media uh, that uh, uh, um, Yi Xinhua um, mentioned. Uh, it, it, made sense. it made sense to me. I think it makes sense in the 21st century. And uh, there is a sort of <laughs> Uh, partisanship uh, uh, in in uh, British political discourse where people will dislike an idea just simply because of where it comes from or who it comes from. And um, I, I thought that Theresa May's government had a lot of good ideas and just because they're not in power any, uh, or just because uh, you, uh, it didn't work out politically for Mrs. May doesn't mean that she and Jeremy Hunt didn't know what they were talking about. I think they exactly knew what they're talking about. And uh, especially around public diplomacy, Jeremy Hunt's one of the few uh, politicians with, with who's actually um, worked in uh, cultural um, diplomacy. Uh, the final thing I wanted to say is that I, I think that um, uh, thinking when we start moving public diplomacy into a onto the kind of collective landscape that you see evolving naturally in Europe, um, it, it goes to, uh, starts to point up some of the problems of particular um, unilateral public diplomacies and some uh, regional partners uh, of, of South Korea, I feel are too idiosyncratic in their approach to public diplomacy, too unilateral and too involved in promoting their own national distinctiveness rather than looking at ways of, uh, of partnering. And, and, and so I, I hope that, I think there's a very clear role for South Korea in uh, presenting an alternative model of, um, of collaborative public diplomacy and investment in uh, improving one another's uh, the realities on which one, one another's images are based. Anyway, I hope that makes sense. I want to leave time for President Han. Uh, and I'm sorry I haven't done justice to the excellent questions, which I appreciated. Thank you, Nick. Uh, in tech? Uh, thank you uh, for the excellent questions. And, um, and oh, you, do you have my video or not? Okay, okay. Um, thank you for the excellent questions and, and comments. Some of them are really hard to, to answer. But let me start by uh, mentioning that uh, Professor Yi Shina is now uh, president of uh, Korea Academic Council on United Nations System. So we have uh, uh, Professor Chun, who is the president of Korea, uh, Korea Association, of, Association of International Studies, and Pre Pre Professor, Professor Lee, who is the president of uh, KCUNS, Two of the Korea's major academic institutions are present here as a discussant. It's a, it's a, it's a pleasure and an honor, and I, I feel uh, I'm, I'm in awe. Um, I, I think uh, one, big, uh, one very basic question uh, is about uh, the, the scope of the region. Uh, my, my study on Park Geun-hye's government and also Moon Jae-in's government uh, uh, suggests that they are primar primarily focused on Northeast Asia. Uh, so for them, Northeast Asia is, is the region they belong to, and Northeast Asia is where they, they have to promote uh, peace, uh, peace and prosperity uh, there. That's their primary kind of region and primary responsibility. They did talk about uh, other regions as well, like you know, Bakunet's government uh, uh, proposed Eurasian initiative, uh, working with uh, Eurasian uh, countries in Eurasia. 
And then uh, Moon, Moon Jae-in government uh, proposed uh, uh, new Southern policy and new Northern policy, each uh, proposing, uh, each kind of promoting uh, cooperation between South Korea and, 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 and Russia and other uh, Northern countries, and also South Korea and, or, and, and Southeast Asian countries. But they didn't think that uh, these, these policies do not, do not uh, uh, assume that Korea and Southeast Asia form a single region. They belong, uh, Southeast Asia is a, is a different region and, and South Korea is, is, is a different region, which is Northeast East Asia. So in that sense, I, I, in that sense, I think uh, U.S. initiative or new Southern policy or new uh, Northern policy are not regional policies. The only regional stability and prosperity policy we have uh, the past two uh, government is, is Northeast Asia uh, uh, Peace and Cooperation Initiative and Northeast Asia Peace and Cooperation uh, Platform uh, Initiative. So, so uh, Northeast Asia is, uh, as far as our image, image, diplomatic image, imagination went, we don't go uh, beyond that. And that kind of uh, links to, that brings me to the second uh, point, which is, uh, how to reconcile in the Pacific with Northeast Asia. Um, I don't think Northeast Asia, uh, uh, that's, that's actually beyond the scope of, of my presentation. My, my presentation was about the role of public diplomacy in, term, in kind of promoting regional stability and, and prosperity. But uh, this question about Indo-Pacific and Northeast Asia is about reconciling to different uh, regional cooperation schemes. And I think in the Pacific is not a multilateral cooperation uh, uh, policy because uh, it, it is a multinational initiative, not multilateral initiative. Multilateral uh, initiative should be open and it is not, uh, not designed to contain any particular country. But in the Pacific is intended to contain uh, a particular set of country, a particular country or a particular set of country. So in that, in that sense, I think that's, that's not a uh, good case of multilateral cooperation. It is a multinational coalition building against, uh, against uh, uh, a certain uh, adversarial state. Uh, if that's the, the essence of in the Pacific uh, 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 strategy or initiative or design, then it is. It may be hard to reconcile with uh, North East Asia, South Korea's North East Asia uh, 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 policy, because South Korea's North East Asia policy is not intended intended to contain uh, China, whereas in the Pacific may be intended to contain China. Then there is a contradiction. So in that case, uh, no no public diplomacy, uh, no uh, uh, no uh, no uh, other effort can uh, reconcile. Uh, to uh, contradictory uh, kind of policies. Um, because we don't have enough time, uh, let me just uh, say that um, epistemic community uh, has to be, uh, the epistemic community that I talked about is transnational epistemic community. The idea is that you have regional stability and regional prosperity when the countries are like-minded. When you have like-minded countries as your neighbors, then you are likely to have more trade. You are likely to have more discussions and so on. So that's when uh, that's, you, you can have uh, uh, peace and prosperity when you have like-minded countries. And when there are like-minded people in every country around you, then you are likely to have more discussion and you are likely to have uh, more interactions with each other. So epistemic community, when it, when it is trans transnational, it means that like-minded people uh, 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 exist in, in the countries alongside yours. So, so you, when you have like-minded people, you have more dialogue. When you have like-minded uh, countries, when you have more cooperation. So put uh, in very simple term, that's the point of my presentation. Epistemic community uh, uh, promotes uh, multilateral cooperation, which is good for regional stability and prosperity. And, <clears throat> and that is at least what the studies on South Sea Asia have shown us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Intech. Well, last May, uh, 
the two leaders of our country, Korea and the United States, President Moon Jae-in and President Joe Biden, they agreed to deepen and expand uh, our bilateral partnership in new areas that will uh, include climate change, uh, global health, uh, emerging technologies, supply chain, uh, migration and development, and, and, and many more, which means that I think there's a, they actually, we are opening a new chapter for a uh, upgraded uh, bipartisan uh, bi bilateral partnership between our two countries. So, uh, which which actually reminds me of two keywords in the in the in the in in, in the field of public diplomacy. The first one is a uh, uh, regional partnership, global partnership over over those issues that I just mentioned, and another one is a collaborative public diplomacy, uh, as as uh, Nicholas uh, Nicholas called. Uh, mentioned in his uh, last remarks. Uh, for that possible, I think uh, we actually uh, work together collectively uh, and we have to go beyond uh, the state-centered, self-centered national and state identity and, and pursuing something more, extending the boundaries, perimeters of, of uh, our identities in, in search of common identities. Uh, so the journey, I think, uh, uh, is just started. And then uh, I really thank you uh, for all those uh, uh, excellent presenters uh, and, and, and uh, discussants. And please join me thanking uh, our uh, discussants and panelists today. Thank you very much. With big hand. Now close the, close, this will close the session. Thank you. It was a valuable time to think various issues concerning public diplomacy strategies and realities visions. Thank you for all the presenters, moderator, panelists, and all the audiences. Now we will have five minute break time. Then we'll start session three at 4.10. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, uh, ladies and gentlemen, session three is going to start in two minutes. I ask that you please take your seat. Have you enjoyed the forum? Finally, session three is, has begun. Session three on culture and media, Korea-US public diplomacy will follow. This session will be moderated by Ho Chang Shin, a professor of strategic communication on Sogang University, a president of the Korean Association for Public Diplomacy. Please a big welcome and applause. Good evening, here and there. <laughs> yeah, uh, we, we're gonna have uh, two outstand, outstanding presenters. Uh, one is Guy Golan, Professor Guy Golan from Texas Christian University. And the other one is Jin Dal Young from Simon Fraser University. And we have two uh, panelists, excellent panelists, uh, Dr. Young Gil Che, and the other is Kim. And we, uh, each presenter will have 20 minutes, and panelists will have 10 minutes. And we're gonna have an exciting and dramatic subject. Therefore, I expect many questions from the floors. Therefore, I ask the presenter to keep time. And the first presenter, Dr. Gaigora is there. I think there's one, one o'clock there or two o'clock. Thank you for keeping this forum well. <laughs> okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, are thank you ready? You. I am ready, yes. Okay. Uh, uh, would you like me to speak for 10 minutes? Or I was told 40 minutes. I want to make sure I got the right time frame. Oh, 10, 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Yeah, you have 20 minutes. Perfect, no problem at all. Well, thank you very much, everyone, to the organizers for inviting me. And yes, it is 2.15 in the morning here in Texas. So um, I will do my best to articulate uh, my key points in uh, the best manner that I can. Um, today, I would like to speak of the power of the news media in, and its role in shaping uh, relationships between governments and their stakeholders. I do wanna premise and say that my view of public diplomacy is quite different than many other scholars in the field. And uh, I hope that uh, my contribution here will be interesting to folks. Um, I do want to also premise that my ex area of expertise is American and um, Middle East international relations. So I do apologize if I am not um, up to speed in all details of uh, US career relations, but I believe that my presentation will be of value. So with that being said, um, if, you, if I may, I would like to share with you all uh, a short presentation, 20 minutes long, and uh, please let me know if you need me to cut it shorter, if in time. Okay, uh, when people think about public diplomacy, they think about it in many different ways. For me, public diplomacy really focuses on how governments build, establish, and maintain real, mutually beneficial relationships 
with foreign publics, right? And the aim of public diplomacy is really on pr uh, promoting support for foreign policy. So for me, public uh, diplomacy is much more of a tool of international relations where the goal is to promote support for foreign policy rather than simply promoting soft power. Uh, I come from the school of thought of uh, political and strategic communications and everything I'm gonna speak about today really deals with how research and strategic planning can help governments yield the best results for public diplomacy campaigns. In the center of everything will be the media for me. Um, everything I think about when it comes to public diplomacy comes from um, the concept of winning hearts and mind, a concept that I've seen fail miserably for the United States of America as it tried to engage the Arab and Muslim world for nearly two decades. The battle for hearts and minds is a theoretical philosophical battle that is not really focused and it can oftentimes lead to um, the lack of success in engagement of stakeholders. Uh, when I thought about and did some research about Korean public diplomacy, I, I was looking at some of the key goals of um, the government's public diplomacy campaign. And for me, the one in the center, gaining global support for Korea's policy is the main objective of, of any government's public diplomacy as I see it. Whereas the other uh, stated objectives are more like tools that a government can use to try to help gain support for foreign policy. So um, much like in Korea, the United States always tries to gain um, awareness and knowledge of American values, American culture, American language amongst foreign stakeholders. For me, again, this is a tool. The goal is to gain support for foreign policy. What I would like to speak about today is the concept of mediated public diplomacy. And I would like to try to uh, bring forward the argument that mediated public diplomacy campaigns are very different than traditional PD in the sense that they are very much, as I said, strategic. So immediate public diplomacy campaign would have very, very smart objectives, specific, measurable, tenable, realistic, and time-bound objectives. For example, instead of just saying, hey, we want to you know, raise awareness of K-pop, we would say we would like to raise awareness. And again, I made this up, you know, everybody in the room knows much more about Korean uh, international relations than I do, but to raise awareness about potential danger of North Korea's missile, missile system amongst American journalists by 16% within three months. So we're moving away from general discussions of what potentially a country could achieve to, uh, focusing on super specific measurable objectives that can be evaluated and we can measure a return on investment. Why is this so important? Well, let's talk about mediated public diplomacy, what it is, what it stands for and why it matters. In the original conceptualization of mediated public diplomacy, Professor Robert Entman spoke about the organized attempts by president and his foreign policy apparatus to exert as much control over the framing of foreign policy, over the government's policy in foreign media. This uh, definition is a fantastic definition, but it's outdated a little bit. So more recently, my colleagues and I updated this definition, and we really are talking about how governments not only try to uh, influence how media outside the nation uh, talk about its foreign policy, but how a government can actually promote its own frames regarding its own foreign policy amongst, again, very targeted uh, stakeholders. And the focus here is not only on traditional earned media in the public relations sense, but also owned media, paid media, and more importantly these days, shared media with social media. So the focus here is on the PESO model, the PESO model which 
integrates various channels of media, the ones we own, such as our websites, the ones we earn, such as we do when we send our spokespeople to other media outlets, right? So maybe the Korean government sends a um, representative to speak on Al Jazeera, Al Arabiya, BBC, and so forth. Uh, shared media, this is all the content that people share in social media. So how does the government build a strategic media strategy, right? For its specific stakeholders, it's trying to reach and its own um, paid media, which is paid advertising, whether it's promoted tweets, uh, influencer marketing, and so forth. In my research, my key argument has been consistently over the last 15 years that while all of the public diplomacy programs, the soft power programs, as I refer to them, that most people are, are aware of, exchanges, language programs, cultural programs are, are, are useful, they're good. The vast majority of people around the world will never participate in those programs. Rather, most people will learn about nations and countries from either the news media or traditional media or as social media, right? So I really believe in the power of media in shaping public opinion. But it goes a little further. In my integrated public diplomacy model that I published several years ago, I argue that media and public diplomacy, right? The ability to really tell a story through the news media in a very strategic manner is almost a prerequisite for building a nation's re reputation and positioning. And ultimately, only have, if you have the first and then the second, will you be able to successfully build your relationship with your key stakeholders. So ultimately, what I would like to speak about in the next few minutes is how does a country design a strategic public, immediate public diplomacy program? And the answer really goes with research and goal setting, goal and objective setting, programming and evaluation. The first question that I always ask everybody in public diplomacy is very specific. Who is your specific stakeholder that you're trying to engage in your public diplomacy efforts? So when the United States try to establish relations with the Muslim world, they essentially try to establish relationships with a billion people. It was a very um, unfocused campaign. It didn't have the insights about the audience and essentially, they were just trying to throw, you know, throw mud on the wall and whatever stuck, stuck. Uh, in the media public diplomacy perspective, a government must make some decisions. It must, must prioritize one stakeholder over another. In other words, if South Korea, for example, would like to think about how to allocate its public diplomacy resources, it has to understand that it cannot target everybody in the world in a successful manner. So my question would be, who are the key stakeholders, right? Is it, is it people in India? Is it people in China? Is it people in Australia, the United States? And if it is people within, let's say, India or the United States, who are those folks? Who are those people? And what do we know about this audience? And the good, the good answer, the good great thing is that today, thanks to social media analytics, which I would like to speak about in a few minutes, social media analytics allows us to get a great understanding of our target audiences. And we use social media listening and social media analytics to come up with the right insights to design very targeted strategic narratives that allow us to engage our stakeholders in a successful and measurable manner, right? So once we know who our specific target audience is, we can ask, what is the right message to send to this audience? A strategic narrative is the key fundamental message strategy for the public diplomacy campaign in all of its media outlets. This is not a slogan such as Nike's, just do it, but rather, it articulates 
the common values, the common goals, and the common interests that the nations share. And I am a big believer that ultimately governments and people act on self-interest. And I recently wrote and am writing a project on the power of strategic alliances. Governments and people around the world form alliances based on short-term needs, such as solving a local geopolitical issue or dealing with the coronavirus or dealing with an economic challenge or an opportunity. So strategic narratives are really important and they're really important because of another key element of media public diplomacy, which is frame building. My key argument here is that every nation around the world not only has to promote its own framing of its own foreign policy, but it also needs to counter the frames of its foreign policy presented by its international rivals. So for example, when the United States would like to articulate its foreign policy in let's say Asia, Southeast Asia, for example, right? It not only needs to present its own strategic narratives, its own frames, it also needs to counter that of China's regarding the US policy in the region. So this slide here kind of explains the challenges of media public diplomacy where every nation not only tries to promote its own frames, it also tries to promote frames about its international rivals. And then each nation also tries to counter those frames. We are essentially talking about a battle for foreign pol uh, public opinion, the media wars, the battle over media framing, how foreign policies are framed in international media. And again, here is where social media analytics have become so important in designing effective media campaigns. Back in the day, a lot of countries spent a lot of money on reputational research, on trying to understand how pe other people in other countries think about them. Today, thanks to social media listening, we are able to really pinpoint our target audience and learn everything there is about them in terms of what issues or topics are interested, how they're talking about those issues and topics, so conversation gaps, who are the key influencers in those conversations, and how sentiment changes negative, positive, neutral over time on the different social media platforms. This is key because a social media strategy cannot be effective unless you have your finger on the pulse of your audience at all times. The media strategy also has to recognize the international assets of different nations. In the last 15 to 20 years, we saw the proliferation of the information wars where countries, even small countries like Qatar, right? Who didn't really have a lot of um, hard power assets suddenly had Al Jazeera and Al Jazeera became a true media powerhouse for them. And here I'm not talking about soft power in the terms of people respecting Qatar, I'm talking about Qatar's ability to frame international relation events, such as the Arab Spring, where Al Jazeera was instrumental in shaping the outcomes on the street and really pushing how the Arab Spring was framed, not only within the Arab world, but also in the international news media, including European and Western media. So again, I'm speeding up uh, to respect the time limits. I wanna talk about program evaluation. The media public diplomacy approach really looks at social media analytics, the tools of research that allow us to not only design our strategic narrative, but also evaluate our campaigns throughout the, meet, the integrated channels, right? Paid, earned, shared, and owned and continuously adjust it. Now, when we think about um, US-Korea relations, as, as we're talking about today, think about how the Biden administration and the Trump administrations 
completely presented different strategic narratives to its international allies and rivals. These narratives are typically presented via media channels. And not only do governments trust that countries will tell the story appropriately, but they promote the frames, not only through traditional public relation tactics, such as uh, media events, but also through social media accounts, through government sponsored, government owned media, um, and, and public relation campaigns. So as the battle for international public opinion continues to evolve, I want to ask everybody here in the room to think about modern public diplomacy as equivalent to a political campaign, where countries focus on unilateral public diplomacy. Unilateral, I heard my friend Nick Cole speak about collaborative public diplomacy. I wanna argue for unilateral public diplomacy campaigns where each government really focuses on how to position itself in the eyes of its stakeholders. Because ultimately reputation is something you do not control. You only control your own positioning and you can create the best positioning by really understanding what the purpose of your campaign is and who your target audience is and then what they care about. Then the next question is, what are your media assets? This is my friend, Sang Moon Yang. I, I, didn't know who the, I didn't know who the top speaker would be, right, in South Korea, but who are the most respected journalists? Who are the journalists or the opinion makers that can go in foreign media and articulate Korea's strategic narrative? What, what social media apparatus the South Korea currently have, and does it have the, the social media accounts in the right languages for the stakeholders that it really cares about? And lastly, does South Korea have a social media listening apparatus right now that will allow it to use social media listening and analytics to not only identify its stakeholders, but listen to them, learn everything about them, and design the right messages for them. Again, public diplomacy should not be a general concept that tries to follow soft power or something, you know, a, a cloud in the sky, but rather some, let's focus on strategic objectives that are smart, attainable, measurable with a specific target audience, and really think about public diplomacy as a tool of international relations that helps governments get support for its foreign policy abroad. So we're moving away from just soft power to really thinking about strategic campaigns. We're thinking about PD as a tool of international relations and everything is managed by smart objectives, smart, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time bound. Analytics is king. Analytics helps us make the right decisions. And finally, I wanna leave you all with one last question. Who is in charge? of your public diplomacy campaign. And I don't mean generally, I mean, who's running the show like a campaign manager in a political campaign. This is everything I wanted to say in exactly 19 minutes and 45 seconds. I thank you all for your attention and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Goran. Please keep over because we're gonna have questions, I think. <laughs> and next, we're going to have uh, Dalyong Jin um, from Simon Fraser University, and he's there. Okay, uh, thanks so much uh, for, you know, the agitator of final presenter. I want to thank to Professor Yong Gil Che uh, for organizing this wonderful event, and thanks for inviting me to the forum. Uh, I'm going to talk about transnational convergence in East Asia, focusing on cultural uh, diplomacy and the media diplomacy. In a previous session, uh, the, the Dr. Han Yin uh, talked about uh, you know, the, the importance of East Asia as a region. He said you know, exactly why uh, you know, the public diplomacy is a promising new tool. Uh, East Asia, uh, uh, East Asia may not may not be the best place it can be applied. Uh, he you know, that mainly 
uh, talked about the lack of the tool to you know the uh, collaborate to cooperate among uh, East Asian countries. But uh, let me say that we can do this kind of the collaboration through popular culture. So my focus is the uh, the uh, the increasing increasing role of popular culture uh, media in enhancing not only national images but also the collaborative you know, the uh, East Asian uh, you know the soft power. Over the past you know, the decade or so, Asia has become one of the most significant places in cultural production. Now, when I say cultural production, it means not only the production of popular culture, but also the consumption of popular culture. Uh, you know, the, from the end of the production to the consumption, uh, Asia, in particular East Asia, uh, has rapidly uh, grown. Uh, during the process, several Asian countries such as uh, China, Japan, previously Hong Kong, and the Korea have advanced their cultural content and attempted to develop Pan-Asian cultural identity. Uh, they work together through co-productions and uh, you know, the convergence of you know, the, uh, popular culture uh, to develop one large cultural identity. Uh, from the end of the uh, co-production to the end of the convergence of uh, East Asian pop culture, as it is the end of the previous works uh, uh, imply. Uh, therefore, I would like to talk about uh, a few major dimensions. Uh, first of all, the cultural collaboration process of East Asian region, meaning transnational convergence in East Asia in two ways. The first one is state-led top-down, and the secondly, private-led bottom-up uh, models. Uh, since uh, public diplomacy emphasizes the collaboration between the public sector and the private sector, this kind of approach may help our understanding of public diplomacy. Uh, secondly, I'm going to talk about cultural convergence and the soft power, mostly talking about mutual understanding between East Asian countries. Uh, finally, uh, I'm going to talk about shifting cultural politics, meaning uh, whether uh, shifting geopolitics has influenced uh, cultural convergence as part of cultural diplomacy. Uh, as you may understand uh, very well, uh, soft power and their cultural diplomacy are very important. Uh, soft power is the ability to entice and attract. Uh, some resources can produce both hard power and soft power. The resources that produce soft power arise from the values a country expresses in its culture, in particular, uh, popular culture uh, these days. Soft power is very important concept in understanding cultural diplomacy. Uh, you know, the uh, cultural diplomacy is a subset of public diplomacy uh, in support of its foreign policy goals uh, uh, to advance national reputation and national images. Nation state, again, China, uh, Korea, Japan, uh, utilize symbolic capital of each age culture in the global politics through actualizing cultural policy. However, the private sector driven soft power policy is also important. We have to understand both the state-led and the uh, uh, private sector-driven uh, soft power models, uh, which are you know, the, uh, eventually connected. Uh, many countries have, the, you know, the, including uh, uh, Western countries and the uh, non-Western countries, have developed the soft power and the cultural diplomacy. It's not for only South Korea, not the Japan only, China only. Every country. Among these, the United States has advanced its strongest uh, soft power policy, uh, meaning the uh, United States has the, in the well-developed cultural industries and therefore uh, you know, the produced high-quality cultural product as a part of the other or in relation to uh, soft power. The cultural industry has been one of the most profitable sectors for the U.S. economy and the national 
uh, images. Therefore, uh, since World War II, the U.S. government has supported the liberalization of uh, international trade. As DNA the can be exemplified in the U.S. Korea FTA, you know, the uh, treaty uh, made in 2006. Uh, in East Asia, uh, China, uh, Japan, and Korea developed their uh, unique cultural diplomacy and the soft power. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, China has developed its cultural diplomacy policy. Chinese officials uh, expressed the importance of China's culture in the early 2000s. Soft power was explicitly uh, referenced in national government policy uh, for the first time in 2007. Uh, one of the major examples of Chinese soft power policy is panda politics. Uh, China uh, selected some countries and sent the panda as a symbol of the uh, mutual interest, as the, uh, you can see uh, in this slide. Uh, Japan has also developed its soft power strategy since the early 2000s in the name of Cool Japan uh, you know, the strategy, uh, you know, the started in the, uh, the early 2010s. Cool Japan policy has engendered uh, attraction uh, toward the benign image of the country Japan and the uh, Japan's role as the disseminator of video games, anime, manga, and the cuisine has transformed Japan as a you know, the culturally uh, desirable place. Most of all, uh, 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 South Korea has advanced one of the most effective cultural diplomacy models due to the Korean wave. The Korean wave has changed the foreign perceptions of South Korea. The success of K-pop, for example, has created a cool national image of soft power in raising its international uh, reputation. Cultural policy since the end of the uh, mid-2000 uh, have been intertwined with the end of the consideration of uh, soft power. Uh, the two most uh, recent example who are the uh, cultural activities in tandem with the soft power happened uh, this year. The one is the BTS visit of the United States you know, the, alongside President Moon Jae-in uh, to give a talk about climate change. The second is the recent you know, the popularity of the end one particular drama uh, titled Squid Game, uh, which is a top program on Netflix uh, in September and October this year, uh, in the, including the United States. These cultural activities uh, work as the uh, symbol of the example of the uh, Korean cultural diplomacy because the, uh, they certainly enhance national images. As the case of BTS and the Squid Game exemplify, the Korean government has uh, you know, the increased its interest in the Korean wave as a good way to enhance soft power and cultural diplomacy. Uh, as this slide uh, explains, uh, between 1998, when the Korean wave you know, the mainly started, and 2017, when the Bakune government ended, each president continued to express his or her you know, the intention to connect uh, popular culture and public diplomacy. The number of the, the presidential speeches uh, talking about soft power and the cultural exchange greatly uh, increased. But not only individual countries, again, uh, most of all, East Asian countries have developed two distinctive uh, dimensions together. The first one is cultural convergence of East Asia. Secondly, cultural diplomacy through cultural convergence, uh, which means that they work together to create a popular culture as a part of their cultural uh, diplomacy uh, strategy. Uh, Asian cultural producers have advanced cultural integration through uh, several uh, forms of their collaboration, uh, like the, the film co-production, uh, the remake of television programs, and the digital media storytelling uh, with the growth of manga uh, in Japan and the, the webtoon in South Korea. Uh, one, uh, uh, it's not working, so let me try. 
Okay. So one major convergence model is a television format, which is the bottom of a convergence model. Again, private related to the uh, soft power, you know, the policy. Uh, format uh, emerged in the, in the 1990s when Japan developed its format alone from you know, the United States. Uh, Japanese television programs early years you know, the, in the growth copied uh, Western programs. TV Tokyo copied the BBC's Antiques uh, in the Road Show, uh, Fuji TV's Emergency Hospital 24 copied American uh, ER, for example. Japan later uh, imported American programs to develop its own uh, unique television programs. The point is that piracy cultures are important. As countries develop their own uh, programs based on these you know, the processes. In East Asia, the desires both to practice piracy and to eradicate it have common root in the midst of build, you know, the building uh, national soft power, as Dent you know, explained. East Asian broadcasters have indeed developed the television formats uh, since the early 19, uh, early 2000. Uh, Asian countries have you know, the, the adapted the Korea-based television programs uh, since the mid-2000 due to the Korean wave boom. Hotelier, uh, Full House, Copy Prince, and the Dream High are all the, the exemplary cases of Korea-based uh, television formats. Uh, Asian countries have created their own versions of Korean TV programs uh, through a uh, television format. Uh, uh, East Asian broadcasters have later uh, developed and received reality shows, not the other uh, drama anymore, including Dead Will Are You Going and uh, Running Man, which are very popular in uh, many uh, East Asian, Southeast Asian countries. The popularity of reality shows uh, started with the success of the Korean version of American Idol uh, Super Stake in 2009. However, uh, many East Asian broadcasters pursue cultural convergence due to uh, financial reasons, not the other cultural reasons, which is the other problematic. They have to emphasize not only money, but also culture that they can share on, uh, during the uh, process. Uh, another form of the convergence and actually second convergence is a state-driven top-down collaboration uh, through film co-production. Uh, East Asia has developed the co-production of film uh, due to the emergence of the regional economy and the influences of the Korean wave. Uh, since the mid-2000, international investors our uh, firms and the practitioners have engaged in various models of collaboration, uh, for example, uh, with the Chinese companies. Uh, Korea, China, you know, the co-production started only uh, about you know, the seven, eight years ago when the, you know, the, these two countries made their film co-production treaty. Korea, China co-productions relied on the involvement of Korean directors and actors in Chinese movies, meaning uh, Chinese cultural forms have been recruiting established uh, Korean directors. Uh, these collaborations have included some uh, co-production movies between these two countries, including uh, Dangerous Reagents, The Mysterious Family, and The Passion Heaven. Uh, in East Asia, uh, uh, several countries have developed their own uh, software strategies. And for China, co-production is the end of one major tool to develop cultural diplomacy. Uh, film is a powerful and effective tool for nation building. Uh, co-productions have a diplomatic function. As the end, the Chinese cultural soft power can be enhanced through utilizing the film uh, co-production model. Some problems uh, you know, the, uh, in the process. Co you know, the uh, co-productions are main means for China to promote its, its vision of social order through the, end, the censorship. A China soft power strategy is undermined by the degree of control of the state over its media. In comparison uh, with its main soft power competitors like Hollywood 
and the South Korea, the Chinese soft power push is more government driven and therefore ruins uh, you know, the, uh, the success of you know, the film uh, project like the, you know, the, the Great Wall made you know, the, uh, several years ago. Japan also uh, developed their convergence as a tool to you know, the advance Japanese soft power. The Japanese government views the cultural industries as a way to upgrade national images. Again, the Japanese government has started to push, uh, you know, the pursue the, you know, the cool Japan project since the late 2000, uh, you know, only a few years ago, emphasizing the appeal of you know, the Japanese popular culture you know, the into additional values. The last thing I like to talk about is the, you know, the regional you know, the politics. Uh, overall, a cultural convergence in East Asia has been embedded in the regional you know, the politics. Due to Korea's colonization by Japan and its concern about the Japanese cultural invasion up until 1998, Korea banned the Japanese cultural product. Japan opened the market to Japanese culture, which made appearance in Korea by only 2002. 2009, you know, the lost memories made in 2002 was the co-production between Korea and Japan, coinciding with the 2002 uh, World Cup game. Original politics has the, uh, the greatly uh, influenced the cultural you know, the content. For example, Japan and Korea developed a friend in 2002 again uh, as the symbol of the, uh, the harmony of these two countries. This is the, one of the first uh, the co-production between these two countries, between TBS in Japan and the NBC in South Korea. This is the trendy drama and the Japanese uh, heroine and the Korean hero overcome all difficulties. The point is that they try to uh, they try to avoid any controversial image that can be associated with their historically sensitive issues. Japanese colonial legacy in South Korea. Uh, since then, all co-productions have to follow this kind of their model in selecting main actors from South Korea and their main actresses from Japan. Uh, to conclude, uh, East Asia has paid attention to culture for soft power and developed several forms of cultural convergence. Cultural producers have worked together to form alliance that facilitate mutual uh, understandings. A nation state no longer determines cultural representation. Again, in order to uh, make their one particular culture from their one particular country, uh, East Asian countries must work together to build, uh, create you know, the uh, culture together to enhance their own uh, cultural you know, the, uh, soft power policy. However, the process of cultural integration cannot be free uh, from cultural politics. Uh, geopolitics surrounding East Asia has sometimes shown co uh, cooperative and at other times conflicting uh, dimensions. East Asia therefore needs to develop more progressive and practical cultural politics toward the better uh, form of cultural convergence and cultural diplomacy. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Jin, for your timely and excellent presentations. Now, um, Dr. Kim of Waseda University there, Yes, I'm here. All right. Uh, thank Dr. you for having me tonight, today, uh, and a very good afternoon, Seoul, and a very good deep midnight, Texas. It's a great to meet you online. Uh, my name is Dr. Kim Gyeongmuk, Waseda University, and I'm a researcher in peace studies, and I my major concern is about transnational civil society networks or NGO studies. And also, as I live and teach uh, in Japan and uh, affiliated with Japanese university, my uh, viewpoint is a bit uh, different from your viewpoint because uh, my angle is based in Japan. And when I heard the topic uh, for the first time, 
uh, when I get invited from Dr. Che Young HUFS, um, strengthening the US South Korean alliance. Uh, it was uh, quite um, well shocking topic because uh, when I live in Japan, um, I thought that strengthening the US South Korean alliance is required or need necessary because it is already consolidated and sure enough uh, for me. So it's quite, um, in that context, it's a very much um, interesting topic to me, uh, to me. And I cannot agree more than two professors presentations which just made uh, minutes ago. And after sharing this uh, positionality of mine, I would like to apply uh, theoretical lessons uh, what you have made in the session three, uh, applying to practical cases or practical approaches uh, related to Japan, South Korean relations or Japan, uh, Chinese or South Korean Chinese relations or even the North and the South Korea, two Korea's relations. Uh, to apply these questions, I mean, to apply these uh, theoretical approaches, I would like to raise uh, four broad questions uh, that would be more or less helpful to all the members uh, in this place. My question number one is, does the U.S.-South Korean alliance compete with the U.S.-Japanese alliance? Yes or no? Uh, if so, if yes, uh, we have to find out how the soft power of public diplomacy will solve the problem, uh, triangulating uh, the diplomatic relations. And the question number two might be this, does South Korea want to pursue the US on its foreign policy towards Japan, uh, particularly on the issue of historical or territorial issues, uh, for example, or sometimes we can uh, raise the issues related to North Korea and the South Korea's relationship between the uh, on the Korean Peninsula, and uh, uh, question number three is: uh, Do bilateral bilateral or government-driven relations play more roles, or multilateral or multi-track relations play more roles effectively? Uh, we need to uh, or dig into the possibility or many approaches. Uh, in what context uh, this approach will work more or that approach sometimes uh, work more. And my last question number four is, do we believe that public diplomacy will strengthen the US-South Korean alliance? I mean, applying the case of K-pop or uh, cultural issues, uh, sometimes it helps. But uh, when we consider about the US-South Korean alliance issues, uh, it connotes more or less very really a strategic or security or militaristic approaches. So uh, we have to consider how cultural issues uh, surpass or collaborate with the uh, strategic issues. Without raising these questions, uh, maybe our discussion might be too broad or too idealistic sometimes, and it would be very difficult to develop academic agenda or policy related uh, agenda um, so that uh, as a result, uh, no one will not seriously consider the public diplomacy issues. It's just a buzzword or boom for the limited time. I'm just afraid and I believe uh, public diplomacy and soft power will work, play a lot of roles so that we have to consider and develop these issues more and more um, by having this kind of public forum, I believe. Okay. Um, Okay, in my understanding, uh, as time is very much limited, I try to be very uh, brief. Uh, I think there are three arenas on public diplomacy. Uh, in my understanding, the first arena is media diplomacy as uh, Professor uh, Guy Golan uh, has mentioned. And uh, this includes public opinion and public relations uh, using the broadcast or media. Uh, whether it is new media or old media. And the second arena is international cultural diplomacy. Uh, for example, Korea Foundation, Japan Foundation, USA, uh, no, UZIA, or sometimes uh, Kansu Institute uh, in China. Uh, 
uh, play this kind of role to promote cultural exchange program or people to people exchange. And the last one, International Development Corporation, uh, COICA or JICA or USAID or some uh, international agency, including UNDP, will collaborate sometimes on uh, war-related issues or humanitarian disaster, for example. Um, but over the last 20 or 30 years, uh, when looking at the Japanese policy on public diplomacy or soft power, Japan uh, tried to collaborate with South Korea and China for um, between the 1990s and 20s. Uh, however, since 2010s, 2010s, Japan is more uh, tried to collaborate with ASEAN countries uh, because China and South Korea are realized and turned as rivalry relations. So uh, when let's again, let's consider about uh, uh, practical and idealistic approach at the same time, if we try to, or if we believe we need to uh, strengthen the US and South Korean alliance, we have to include, or we have to apply the very broad concept at the same time. Um, without uh, applying these approaches, um, our discussion will be missing at some point. So uh, I believe the next or continuously, uh, we believe the second uh, discussion will be held sometime soon. And for the for concluding uh, point, uh, when applying the prosperity and reunification or coexistence of the two Koreas, uh, there might be some dilemmas. Remembering the Korean War, in terms of justice or human rights, we, when we try to remember all the historical or war-related memories, there might be conflict between uh, the, I mean, textbook approaches. So um, as time is limited, I will be stopped here, but uh, um, my, Concluding point is US-South Korean alliance are very much important, no doubt that, but uh, there might be some dilemmas and complicated situation apply, um, remained and raised. So I would like to hear more about these problems or tricky, um, I mean, dilemmas from the presenters or audiences. Thank you very much. Thank you. He raised several questions and comments related to Japan. Therefore, I'll give five minutes for each presenter after finishing Dr. Che's comment on this presenting. Yeah, Dr. Che. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you for the wonderful presentation from the uh, Professor Jean and the Professor Colan. Um, Professor Colan's uh, mediated public diplomacy reminds us that we live in an era of uh, um, where public diplomacy policies cannot be separated from the media. And Professor Dalyung Jin argued that East Asia needs to develop more progressive and critical cultural chemistry toward the better of cultural convergence and cultural diplomacy. Um, I cannot actually argue against these uh, ideas because they are actually wonderful alternatives to the situation that we Korea actually face right now. Uh, while I do 100% agree with the two professors' proposals, but it seems very difficult to imagine how to collaborate on mediated public diplomacy through media and through cultural convergence in Northeast Asia. In terms of media industry perspective, the cultural exchange and understanding, I think, can find a very bright spot on their products and services. But in media reality, it seems like more dire uh, to me. Uh, in fact, have the, uh, uh, I'm not sure, have the governments in these countries, um, in this era, area, ever engaged in conscious and sustainable collaborative relations? And in fact, have the publics in these countries of each country ever imagined and hoped for the collaborative publics to win hearts and minds from uh, each other's eyes? In particular, East Asia's media ecosystem actually does not seem favorable for public diplomacy or convergent cooperation. 
uh, regardless of the sharp increase in the exchange of media products and consumptions, the dominant mass media outlets of three countries, Korea, China, and Japan, still frame national and international issues centered on their own ideologies. In fact, some of the influential media web medias weaponize the media, trying to transform the soft power platform into hard power tools. News about China and news about Japan in Korea make it difficult to understand rationally and to enhance a diplomatic understanding. The issue frame war between conservative and progressive media causes the public to disconnect with each other without mediating the relationship between China and Japan. And the nationalist confrontation between the users of YouTube and SNS in each country seem to be so severe. And far-right messages that hate other countries combined with the frame of the mass media make it difficult for the government to actively intervene in diplomacy. Uh, I think the tension in the international order created by the confrontational structure between the US and China will make, it, make this antagonism and conflict uh, more difficult to mediate. Uh, in particular, I think it is more difficult to find a mediated public diplomacy alternative because the media space cannot be intervened by the government and the unified control of the public. Uh, for example, the YouTube, the platforms are not belong to a nation, but are global, which make it hard to intervention by a single country. Moreover, they are not just the listeners, users, or viewers. The publics are more than that. They are active network organizer uh, on the SNS platforms. So when we talk about the media, I think we are talking about the people actually nowadays. Uh, how can we intervene in the people? Uh, it's, I think this is kind of more difficult than uh, in the before. So my question is, what are the possible ways for the government to mediate the angry nationalist publics, especially who empower themselves through hatred on the media? I think this question uh, is not confined in this uh, East Asian countries, but also uh, can be applied to other uh, regions such as Palestinians and other conflict regions too. So um, I think this is a, uh, most uh, yeah, uh, challenging question uh, to me. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Gary Goran is there? The same. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you are not sleeping. <laughs> All right. Uh, you, you have five minutes. Okay. Well, thank you uh, very much. Excellent uh, discussions and a wonderful presentation on uh, cultural diplomacy, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I wanna to touch upon the last question first, if I may, and that is uh, who really controls the conversation about any topic, right? And especially on social media, can a government intervene in a conversation about its foreign policy? And my answer would be that a government is very much like any brand. So think about Facebook. Yesterday, Facebook faced very negative uh, discourse on both social media and in the mainstream media, not only in the United States, but all around the world. There was an outage and people were presenting different theories about why there was an outage. And there was uh, a lot of discourse about what Facebook knew or didn't know about its own research and how it manipulated it. And I'm gonna ask, answer your question with a question and that is, could Facebook allow itself to not respond? Could Facebook allow itself to not have a strategic narrative to put in place? Could Facebook allow itself not to promote frame to counter the frames of its rivals who are trying to undermine it? So just like brands face this challenge every single day, whether it's Samsung or you know, Toyota or you know, any of the Chinese brands or any of the you know, European brands, so do governments. Most people in the world don't know anything about international affairs and they will learn from the news media and they will learn from social media. And this is why governments have to make it a priority in terms of resources to 
always continuously engage in the conversation and promote its own friends. Oh. And then you Right. Thanks so much. Uh, maybe you know, I may uh, respond to the another two you know, the panelists uh, with the another three you know, the main point. The first part is you know, the, the role of the you know, soft power. Uh, just many you know, the argued that soft power is not realistic because it, uh, soft power is not measurable, unlike the, you know, the hard power and economic power. In terms of how hard power, like the military power, you can measure easily. How many tanks do you have? How many guns do you have? Therefore, you know, the, it's easy to you know, identify who is the, you know, the strongest, who is the weakest. In terms of the economic power between hard power and the soft power, uh, it is similar. What about your, your GDP? What about your, your personal income on average by country? Therefore, you know, the, they easily they select the toughest and the lowest. But uh, in terms of the soft power, it's not easy to measure or you know, the, it's not the, the, you know, the calculable, which is the, the big problem. Therefore, you know, the, when the I talked about introduced the, the notion of soft power, many criticized the, the lack of the practical you know, the measures, which means that it's almost impossible for us to see whether soft power may enhance national images or in particular hard power. That's the end of one particular thing we have to uh, think about. Secondly, uh, in terms of the, the public diplomacy or cultural diplomacy as a part of the public diplomacy, is it the, the, the combination between the private sector and the, the, the public sector? Unlike the, the foreign policy, mainly uh, driven by the government, uh, public diplomacy uh, should be done most, mostly by the private sector, supported by the, the government. That's the, the notion of the, the uh, public policy. Uh, cultural policy is, is the subset of public policy. Uh, it mainly should be done by, driven by the, the, the uh, private sector. Therefore, how to let the, you know, the private sector play is very important. As I explained, China, uh, you know, the Chinese government you know, controls uh, almost everything in terms of you know, the popular culture through the, you know, the censorship. Therefore, sometimes they put a lot of the ideology. They make their main melody dramas, which means that mostly they fail in you know, the, uh, you know, the uh, attracting of uh, foreign investment. They must let their private sector play. That's the, uh, the second thing we have to think about. So uh, whether you know, the, the uh, cultural policy or soft power enhances the, the relationship between Korea and the US or Korea and the Japan, it's also very important, but uh, very difficult. But uh, uh, in my understanding, uh, it helps a lot. Instead of the, uh, you know, the, we, we cannot provide the numbers, but uh, in, in, uh, intuitively we say that, uh, you know, the soft power, uh, uh, you know, the BTS, uh, you, know, the, uh, you know, the parasite, uh, squid game, for example, uh, certainly uh, enhance their national images to the end of the uh, foreign, you know, the citizens, including American citizens, and therefore uh, it helps the relationship between two countries. Uh, you know, the, uh, that's the end of the, uh, I have to say. Um, the, the Gyeongmok uh, Kim particularly, you know, they talked a lot about, uh, you know, the uh, Japan, you know, the focused, you know, the uh, discussions. Yes, so whether U.S.-Korea alliances uh, may compete U.S.-Japanese alliance, you know, the uh, so and so forth. But uh, uh, again, uh, there are some the other conflict, there are some tensions. But uh, uh, most of all, uh, the point is that uh, countries. Uh, between US Korea or between US China uh, may you know, develop the mutual uh, collaboration. Therefore, they may overcome the kind of their conflict through the, you know, the cultural collaboration and the, you know, the cultural uh, convergence. One last thing I want to talk about 
is the relationship between China and Japan and China and Korea and Korea and you know, the Japan uh, culturally. It's very interesting. The tension between uh, Japan and the, you know, the China is more sensitive than the relationship between uh, Japan and the Korea for many Japanese. Therefore, they don't develop their collaboration between two countries. Korea, Japan, Korea, China have developed lots of you know, the, uh, collaborations, but uh, Japan and the China, they don't because of their Japanese legacy of their colonialism, of course, southern part of the, you know, the uh, China. So uh, it uh, totally uh, depends on their national views and their national uh, kind of sentiment in understanding. Therefore, what I'm talking about is that these countries must develop a bit progressive, a bit practical ways to enhance uh, their collaboration uh, through their co-production, through their the format, and through Yes, uh, you know, I didn't talk about because of time limit, uh, you know, the uh, transmedia uh, storytelling developed by the manga in Japan and developed by the, uh, the webtoon in South Korea. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to ask you the questions. You, you have questions in Korea? You, you've been here more than four hours and you, you need to ask the questions. The floor or online questions before finishing this session. Uh, Dr. Golan, these uh, questions of uh, is there Korean uh, media asset? It make me uh, surprising because uh, now we're, we're, we are doing the America and Korea uh, public diplomacies. We have one way media, I think. I read the uh, New York Times, Washington Post through apps. I read the uh, uh, I saw uh, CNN and even Park channels uh, through the broadcastings, but Americans don't listen or read a Korean paper. That's the yeah, big problem. We are doing unaided public diplomacy now. I think so. How, how do you think about it? Dr. Che? How do you think about that? Uh, why, why don't you the, uh, okay, Dr. Gola. Um, it's a very good question. So what you're essentially saying is that one nation has developed more um, media assets than another nation. And as you think about international relations, I, I would argue that having uh, media um, assets is really important. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that Korea needs to establish its own version of Al Jazeera, Al Arabiya, Press TV, what used to be CCTV from China, but rather um, really targeting, let's say, who in the United States is an important stakeholder for Korea? Maybe it's economic leaders, maybe it's journalists, right? Maybe it's government officials, and then designing a very specific social media strategy to engage those specific sta stakeholders, and then through delivering the right messages, the right strategic narratives, through the appropriate social media channels, perhaps, or through using public relation companies. But again, you don't necessarily have to compete with the giants and have these enormous um, government-sponsored uh, media outlets. Many small countries, for example, Israel, they don't have a government-sponsored media arm but they use social media in a very strategic manner. And they also use um, public relation tactics to engage their specific stakeholders. How about Dr. Che, you have something? Um, I think we are living in a kind of very different media um, world. Uh, in the past, people have to seek out to uh, find uh, information about a certain country like Korea, something like that. But nowadays, they don't look for the information about the country. They actually uh, follow the issue and follow stories of their own interest. Uh, for example, they are kind of delve into the Korea issues through the BTS. So they are not just going to Korea to find information about the Korea. They are actually going toward communities of their own interest and then find the information about the Korea. 
So it is kind of very different media systems. Uh, they are actually uh, the way they consume the media contents. So uh, when we talk about New York Times and CNN, I think it is our generation, actually, <laughs> the, uh, the past generation's media consumption habits. Uh, but most actually um, the uh, statistic uh, shows that uh, new generation do not actually uh, dependent on those mass media outlets. They are actually dependent on each other's uh, information sources. So they actually make networks of their information. So uh, my question is, how can we actually find a, a way to uh, have effective mediated public diplomacy policies without understanding the, uh, um, the uh, accurate, um, the, the way users uh, consume the media in each other countries. Uh, Korea has their own way to consume media, so US probably and Japan, uh, China. Actually, we are not aware of how Chinese people actually consume their medias, or global media, something like that. So it is kind of very challenging uh, to establish uh, the, uh, the policies on that. Okay, Dr. Jin, you have something? Right, so uh, I think you raised a very interesting, important question, but uh, uh, let me say a bit differently. So uh, first of all, uh, many Koreans, uh, yes, uh, enjoy uh, American newspapers. Uh, American books, but uh, uh, maybe the majority of Americans don't read their Korean newspapers or any kind of information. A bit changed, a bit changed. Meaning, uh, uh, several years ago, there was the only one New York Times reporter in South Korea. Now there are eight people are working in South Korea. Eight people, totally different game. Uh, right, so the, the Seoul is the, the headquarter of the, the East Asia. Therefore, the, the, uh, lots of the, the New York Times reporters are reporting uh, from Seoul, not the, uh, only on the South Korea, but also the, the other uh, East Asian countries. Therefore, the significance of the Korea as the, the, the country is uh, not the same uh, you know, the, with the, 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 uh, several years ago because of several reasons. Uh, secondly, in terms of the, the journalism, yes, but in terms of popular culture, it's not the same because the, the language is not the main issue. BTS, uh, Parasite, uh, Squid Game, DP, uh, there are many, many Korean you know, the popular culture, cultural content. They are all in Korean, but uh, they, uh, global audiences enjoy the Korean popular culture. They don't mind the, 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 the Korean they don't mind the, the, the language issue. Previously, 20 years ago, when Korean wave started, language was kind of the one issue and the cultural you know, the background was another issue. These days, they were not the same because the, the, uh, these days they focus on what they represent, what they portray. Are they portraying the uh, people's struggles? Uh, or difficulties in entering university, in getting the other house, in getting jobs. And therefore, what's the, my second chance? And what's my hope? Therefore, the, uh, the, uh, the, the several Korean you know, the product portray these you know, the universal issues and therefore global audiences in the Korean popular culture, regardless of language issues. So language is not you know, the main issue these days, in the, at least the popular culture. Thank you. Dr. Kim of Waseda is there? Yes, I'm here. Yeah, you, you have something to say? No, I think uh, everyone is tired and I think uh, it's a very good time to conclude. And so skipping my comments or question, uh, this is my best contribution for you. Very good. You know, uh, when I started these sessions, I stand up here and so something strange and I trembling. You know what I'm thinking? I'm attending the skid game. <laughs> yeah, uh, we almost time, uh, only three minutes left and I'm gonna finish the sessions because there are no questions anymore. And we do very fantastic uh, presenters, presentations and panel discussion too. Thank you very much for attending this. Uh,
Thank you. Thank you for all the presenters, moderator, panelists. And now all sessions of the forum have concluded. It was a meaningful time for us to think about the roles, meanings, and methods of public diplomacy beyond the realm of traditional diplomacy. We hope that through today's Korea US Public Diplomacy Forum, diplomatic cooperation between two countries and the relations in the public sector will be strengthened and diversified. I look forward to continuing the next forum for designing the future of both Korea and US in the terms of public diplomacy. Thank you to everyone who has been with us for almost four hours. Today's event video can be viewed on YouTube channel of the Center, of Center on Media Diplomacy. After the forum, we ask for your interest and participation in online idea contest on public diplomacy strategies. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.